Good morning and welcome. Uh, <clears throat> my name is Danilo Petranovich and I direct the Abigail Adams Institute, AAI, located not too far from here in Cambridge. Uh, AAI is a not-for-profit academic institute dedicated to providing supplemental humanistic education to the Harvard University community. Our main focus is uh, on the education of undergraduate students, but our programming, which includes seminars, lectures, reading groups, intellectual retreats, uh, advising and mentoring, this program is generally open to others looking for a community that likes to ask big questions in a holistic way. So come check us out. We are a proud co-sponsor of today's event, but the main sponsor and the initiator of these proceedings is the Institute for Ethics in Communication and Organizations, YECO, at the University of Valencia in Spain. YECO aims to expand knowledge and promote critical thinking about the role of ethics in management, leadership, and communication in organizations. The Institute promotes dialogue between the social sciences and philosophy based on a holistic view of the person. We are especially grateful today to YECO's director, who is also a professor of management and professional ethics at the University of Valencia in Spain. And I'm, of course, speaking of our dear colleague and the heart behind YECO, Dr. Manuel Guillén. Uh, we are likewise deeply appreciative of having this terrific space available today. If you're wondering where you are, this is the Harvard RCC, which stands for Real Colegio Complutense, a center providing academic, scientific, and cultural cooperation between Harvard University and the Spanish system of higher education. We especially thank the director, Jose Manuel Martinez. Thank you for hosting us here today. And let me also recognize um, Mr. Fernando Alvar Gonzalez, the, ge the Consul General of Spain in Boston, for joining us today as well. Okay, the theme of this fifth colloquium grew out of last year's colloquium, and it is on the education of future professionals and, it's, and, ch and the challenges to recover trust in institutions, organizations, uh, and today's leaders. We're concerned about the way we educate our millennials and how this education and these millennials will shape the future of our institutions. In my own teaching and research experience, I frequently come across the term ethical leadership. In 2013 and 2014 in the political science department at Yale, I even taught a course under that very title. It was the most popular course I've, thought, I've taught. The students, the millennials, genuinely wanted to find out whether in today's society, it was possible to be both successful and at the same time to be ethical. That was the overriding concern for the vast majority of my students. Obviously they came to my class with the notion or the possibility that the two, worldly success and ethics, may not necessarily go together. In fact, I would say the students more often than not expected that the two are in deep tension, if not in outright contradiction. Where did the Yale millennials get these ideas from? From their homes, their peers, their TVs and their internets? Um, are they perceptive and accurate in their um, assessment of this reality? And what should be done about this by you know, us in the educator community and also beyond? Those would just be some of the question I hope we will consider today. Uh, as we address the generational challenge that is facing us, namely, how to ensure that young men and women are aware of the great potential for good that is, that is entailed in their own work and careers, and yes, their worldly successes. I turn now to our first panelist. Leon Goldman, Dr. Goldman, currently is the chairman of the Kalman Executive Fellows of the W. Michael Hoffman Center for Business Ethics at Bentley University. He began his career as a surgeon at the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center, where he was active in the clinical education of medical students, residents, and, um, and served as the director of student programs for the department. He was also an associate professor of surgery at Harvard Medical School. Following his leaving clinical medicine, he became the chief compliance and privacy officer for the medical center until he retired from the medical center. His next life was as a medical director and privacy officer for a startup healthcare software company until 2015. He is an active executive fellow for the W. Michael Hoffman Center for Business Ethics in Bentley 
University. Leon, my question to you. Given repeated unethical <coughs> workplace behavior over the years, has business ethics education failed? Interesting question, thank you. And <laughs> welcome to you all. Um, actually, my short answer is no, it hasn't failed. But let me talk about why. Um, it would be wrong, I believe, to conclude that uh, business ethics education has failed because implicit in that conclusion is an assumption about education, which I think is completely wrong. And that is that every time you teach business education or whatever, the students learn everything you want. Business education teaches tenets of, of ethics, it teaches moral decision making, and the assumption is a side effect. People will change their behavior. And I think it is a fallacy to believe that everyone sitting in class is gonna change their behavior based on what you're saying in class. Just like whatever we say here, each of you will take something different away based on who you are, where you are in your life, who your parents were, what your upbringing was, and what work is like, and for students, what their work will be in the future. Um, in fact, I believe that the impact of role modeling is more a determinant of how people will behave and is extremely powerful. Um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. Second, I want to propose that the negative effect on all of us when we compartmentalize ethics, business ethics, medical ethics, social ethics, actually is detrimental to the education and the ethical decision making of individuals. I also, just as an aside, would like to talk about more than just millennials, because I think the faculty have as much to learn as the students. Um, Absolutely. And I also thirdly want to talk briefly about how concentrating on negative effects, all the bad events, is actually detrimental to the, how people perceive the world around them. So let me talk a little bit about role modeling uh, and how I got to seeing that as this powerful force in the education of students. So I was in charge of the clinical rotations in, in medical school at the Beth Israel Hospital. Medical school is sort of unique in that the students leave the school itself and the academic environment and go into the hospitals. It is also unique that you as a teacher in the clinical environment actually see how students are thinking based on what you know about the school curriculum because you're part of that also. Now I did that for 26 years. And during that 26 years we had at least three if not four or five various initiatives to change teaching to make up for deficits in the students. Empathy, listening, delivering bad news. Every five years or so somebody said, well it isn't working, we obviously are doing it wrong. So they changed it. And my observation was, in my short phraseology, there's nothing like a good clinical rotation of residency to destroy an education in medical school. <laughs> what I observed is all these students who really believed and wanted it came in and they were in an environment with senior individuals, both residents and attendings, that they looked up to, that they respected, and they watched them deliver care. And they started to adopt those behaviors. That's why it became so meaningful to me. Um, I came across a statement by Albert Schweitzer. Albert Schweitzer said, example is not the main thing in influencing others. It's the only thing. Mm -hmm. James Baldwin had a quote that children have never been very good at listening to their elders, but they've never failed to imitate them. And I think that that's something that um, we'll talk about further we need to address in business education or any education. First of all, role modeling can be used powerfully to get across the messages you want. And I talk about not only role modeling for individuals, but also what I call organizational role model. So if you think about it, whatever organization you're in, when I was in healthcare, it always became, if you don't measure it, it doesn't matter. If it matters, then you would do so, you'd spend money, you'd measure it, you would expend resources. It's true in all of business. If something matters in business, you spend money on it. And if you say it matters, but it really doesn't, you don't spend, it's not in the budget. Forget about it. That message gets to everybody in the organization. That's the informal culture that starts to grow. 
So I would have conversations with Mike Hoffman when I first started at the uh, Center for Business Ethics. Business ethics education, among other things, when you start talking of compliance, talk about compliance programs. They point out that even if an organization has well-meaning and, and ethical individuals, you need an oversight program. And I think it's you, Manuel, who said, ethics is like a garden. You have to tend to it. You can't just ignore it. You have to check every day. You have to look for the weeds. You have to re-educate. And that's what they teach in business ethics school, except the students sit there and look around. Uh, where's the ethics program for the university? The university says, this is important. We're going to teach it. And then they look around and, well, but you haven't expended any resources, no budget. There's no ethics program for the university to help the professors. There are um, people you can call if you're having a problem who aren't supposed to tell anybody you called and all of that. But there's no formal program that continues the education. In addition to which, a lot of business ethics education doesn't show up across the curriculum. We have a business ethics course. That's nice. I'm in my sales course or my marketing course and I don't hear about it. Business ethics, ethics, forget it being business ethics, ethics and, and value-based behavior needs to find its way across the curriculum. It doesn't have to be the HR person who says we're now going to talk about business ethics and HR. That doesn't work. What does work is the HR educator and HR management just happens to talk about how values play into what we're talking about today. We're going to talk about layoffs. Let's talk about a value-based layoff program. What does it look like when you as HR people lay people off and do it with values, compassion, and integrity? What does it look like when you sell with integrity? If our corporate values are sales, what does it look like when we sell with integrity? Ask that question to Volkswagen. What does it look like when you respect the environment? Well, it didn't look like what you did. Um, and that, to me, gets a little bit to this compartmentalizing. If there are business ethics, and, and this came across to me more powerfully when I was, I had started as the compliance officer. Now, healthcare had no compliance at that time. They didn't know from a compliance program from anything. And they willingly went into it because the Department of Justice had handed them a settlement agreement. That's how you get people to do it. Uh, so I went and I learned from uh, Tim Schultz at Raytheon and others and Mike Hoffman. And they talked about how these are ethics programs. And I went back and I wanted to talk about that at the hospital. And the hospital's answer is, well, we have ethics. We have medical ethics. So I joined the Medical Ethics Committee and they talked about right to die, autonomy, decision making. I'd like to talk about uh, gifting to physicians. We don't do that. That, that's, that's business. No, that's ethics. Uh, and so there's that compartmentalizing that I think is a challenge and we have to also think about because it helps look across things. And the last is concentrating on negative things. And the only thing I'll say in the last minute I have is that came home to me sitting in a lecture given by a federal agent in, about compliance. And he was describing your interaction with federal agents, the Department of Justice people. He said, be prepared because their world is, I know you're lying, I see your lips moving. They live in a world that everything is negative, that they start to see everything negatively. So if all we concentrate is on the negative cases, Enron, Volkswagen, or whatever, the students are going to see the world that way. And I think we have to see it in a different way. And we have to start thinking of other ways to involve students. And I'll stop there. More to say about role modeling, but thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Leon. <clears throat> Dr. Donna Hicks is an associate at the Weatherhead Center for International Affairs at Harvard University. She has been involved in numerous unofficial diplomatic conflict resolution efforts, including projects in the Middle East, Sri Lanka, Cambodia, Colombia, Cuba, and Northern Ireland. She was a consultant to the BBC where she co-facilitated a television series, Facing the Truth, with Archbishop Desmond Tutu, which aired in the United Kingdom and on BBC World. She has taught conflict resolution at Harvard, Clark, and Columbia universities, and she conducts training seminars in the Dignity Model, a human-centered approach to rebuilding conflict relationships in the US and abroad. She's the, she's the author of the book, Dignity, it's a central role in resolving conflict, published in 2011 by Yale University Press. 
and she's the founder of www.declareddignity.com. Donna, what is missing in our education of future leaders? Thank you, uh, Danilo, and I want to thank everyone for coming uh, to this remarkable event that M Manuel has uh, so faithfully organized for now five years, is it? Five years? And I'm most grateful to be um, a part of it because it's, uh, it's an opportunity for me to talk about the work that I do around indignity outside of my field of international conflict. And the, the real fact is that it has relevance, this concept of dignity has relevance not only in politics uh, and in, in their, the international arena where I typically work, but um, I've also had several adventures in the corporate world, in healthcare, in education. Uh, this seems to have touched a, a nerve, this concept of dignity. What is it? You know, why do we all yearn to be, treated, to be treated as if we mattered? And I think asking this question that Danilo posed to me, what's missing in our education I can tell you that when I work with my students, they always um, inevitably say to me, this is the first time that we have been exposed to anything like this in our education, that things that really matter so deeply to us, you know, our shared and universal desire to be treated with dignity is something, sadly, that hasn't really been um, explored that much, and it's certainly not been explored outside of the field of academia and, um, and philosophy especially. So, so when you ask me what's missing in education, I can tell you my students come to me and they say to me, Donna, this is, this is really what matters to us. We really care about these deeper human issues. And I would even venture to say, you know, concern about how people feel valued, whether they being treated as if they are valued, is, is something that we, all of us, every single day of our lives, think about. Why did this person treat me this way? So I think, Danilo, um, what we have ignored in the academy is a, attention paid to this deeper, more, um, you know, inner level of what it means to be a human being. Now, I think about the work of Sir Kenneth uh, Robinson. Some of you may have uh, come across it. He said in his, most, in his most recent book, Creative Schools, he said, you know, we human beings live in two worlds. We live in the world around us, but we also live in the world inside of us. And what education has done brilliantly is taught students about the world around us. But, um, but what, is it, what, is, what is this inner world of ours? We're, we're, it's so private, it's so deep, it's so present in our lives, yet we know so little about it. And this is what my students say they want to understand. They want to understand what it means to be human. And believe me, it's not just self-knowledge in the sense that they want to understand their individual desires or you know, where they can. They want to know what is our shared humanity? What is it that each and every one of us, um, how are we alike? Not so much how we're different. We've spent 30 years talking about diversity and difference. But we want to know about what are our common shared values? What are our common, our shared uh, yearnings and desires? And dignity is one of them. So, um, and I also am reminded by uh, Emerson's quote, which I try to keep in my forefront of my mind all the time, which says that what lies behind us and what lies before us are tiny matters compared to what lies within us. And yet, even though these deep, um, well, you know, let me say emotional aspects of our, our shared humanity, even though they've not been explored, I mean, Kevin knows, he's a psychiatrist, that, and Richard and everyone here on this panel knows that psychology has been remiss because it wasn't until just very recently in the study of the human mind and the human experience, psychology ignored emotions for decades, decades. And now that neuroscience has shown us and given us so much information about what happens in our brain under, uh, especially under emotionally threatening um, situations. For example, when our dignity is being threatened, there are predictable ways that human beings react. And if we don't understand those predictable ways, something that's so common to all of us, I mean, this is why we're in so much conflict, I believe, in the world. Because we have failed, as, an, as uh, our educational system has failed to help people understand and navigate what I call the world within, what, um, what Sir Kenneth um, Robinson calls the world within. 
and I think he talks about education reform, you know, focusing on, on the world within. Richard is doing amazing work on the world within with his Making Caring Common project. He'll tell you all about that. But I use his work. He does, I just met him for the first time today. <laughs> and I use his work um, all the time when, I edu when I'm working in the uh, field of education. And I'm also reminded by what my friend Maria Hadjipavlou here from, uh, she's a Greek Cypriot, but she reminded me of what Socrates said. Socrates said, know thyself. But I don't think he was, again, he wasn't talking about our little individual particularistic qualities. He was wanting us to know about the human experience. They, he was a philosopher asking the big questions. And I think this is where we need to go to. Am I one minute? Okay, okay, so. Um, and, and let me say that it's so exciting that when I do projects in education with young people around dignity, understanding what it means, um, what, how, how it affects our lives and how they can use the inner power of their own value and worth as a resource, as a way to, um, you know, to become resilient, you know, because the world is pretty cruel out there. And if they understand that their dignity is in their hands only and they are the masters of their fate, as Mandela says, um, then you wouldn't believe how, how kids can bounce back. It's the best anti-bullying curriculum, I think, that, um, that we can offer our children, understanding, having them understand that they are valuable and worthy no matter what. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. <clears throat> Dr. Rita Hakume is currently the Associate Director of YECO UV Chair of Business Ethics at the University of Valencia and Executive Director and Researcher at the Institute for Ethics at YECO. She has been a visiting scholar at the Hoffman Center for Business Eth Ethics at Bentley. Her research work focuses on the field of organizational behavior and human resources management, specifically on the influence of impression management techniques in building personal reputation based on leadership and trust, and its impact on corporate reputation. She lectures and teaches professional workshops in different companies, associations, schools, and universities. She's co-author of the project It Personal Branding, a mentoring program for high school students focused on the formation of the whole person in order to create an authentic and genuine personal image. She, um, uh, Rita, my, my question to you. <laughs> what are millennials expecting from us as educators? Uh, thank you very much, Danilo, for your question. I will try to respond. And I guess uh, a good answer will be one that I've heard uh, from a professor. Please tell me, teach me something that I cannot find on Google. <laughs> and I think that young generations, they uh, want something else something uh, related with their desires and the fulfillment of their dreams. And also they want us to share with them our real experiences. And this is not in any YouTube uh, video or Google. Mm. And I'm gonna tell you a, a, an, an anecdote that illustrates, I think, very well uh, the main idea that uh, I've found after years of research. Uh, during these days in Boston, because I'm, I live in Valencia, I'm living here in a student's residence, surrounded by lots of millennials. Mm -hmm. And talking with them uh, about these issues, uh, one of the students uh, told me, well, I want, do you know why? I want uh, um, educators to be honest with me. And I was uh, surprised, and I said, what do you mean by honest with you? And she told me, well, I expect them to tell me the truth and uh, uh, about the things uh, that I need to improve in order to success in my future job. So she was uh, asking for an honest feedback from their educa her educators. And I think what uh, you millennial uh, are asking to me, I thought, uh, is real challenge. Hmm? Uh, because for us, uh, I think it's easier to, to teach technical skills and professional stuff. But teaching in an honest way, I think it requires much more. And what is the much more? <laughs> well, I would say through at least three things. One of them is to really care about, about our students. Uh, I think my students will learn from me only if I really care about them. Mm -hmm. 
The second one is uh, it requires a sincere dialogue. Uh, it's, I think, important to uh, have a conversation at class with them, and it requires time. And uh, it's not always uh, easy because we have a large number of students, uh, but it is important and necessary. And the third and most, most important, I think it requires their willingness uh, to really accept the, that uh, honest feedback and also uh, to dialogue with uh, them about their issues openly. Uh, because according to Aristotle, morality and ethics uh, can only be learned, strictly speaking, but cannot be taught. Mm -hmm. Because the essence of the ethics uh, is human freedom. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, you millennials that are here <laughs> uh, play the leading role in your own education. Mm -hmm. But it's worthwhile to make this effort, mm? even though we all have many students. Uh, um, I remember um, an experience uh, when I uh, was teaching uh, at the end of two years training program in, in Spain. I asked to my students, are you the same person today than when you entered in this program? And the answer of one of them was no. I'm not the same person, now I'm a better one. Mm -hmm. And it was really shock <laughs> to hear, and it was a, a personal discovery, because uh, I think this should be the ideal, whatever the sub subject we did, to help our students to be better people. Mm -hmm. And in this way, we become servant leaders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what is a servant leader? Mm -hmm is a, a leader that helps others to flourish as human beings. And I think if I give my best to my students, uh, I expect to also then become servant leaders, mm? helping others around mm, to flourish. Mm? And one of the students in their resident yesterday, uh, she told me uh, that she has uh, discovered the purpose of his work as a, st as a st student. Right. Mm -hmm. Because uh, two classmates mm -hmm. asked her for help teaching uh, accountancy and finance. And for her was a real discover. And she told me, sometimes educators are focused in hows and what, but not in why. Mm -hmm. So what's the why I'm doing that? No. And she was telling me, smiling, and really proud about her discover, discovery and truly happy mm, because she was uh, getting the best from herself and putting her talents in order to serve others and to contribute to the common good of the society. And I told her, you know what? You are a servant leader. Okay, and how can we do that? Mm? Well, af what I have found after years of research is that uh, it's necessary at least three uh, elements, very briefly, doing, looking, and being. Mm? The first one is doing well, so you must know your stuff. Mm? Uh, you have to work like the best or even better than, than the best. And it's necessary to have a good mentor or participating in a mentoring program. When I say uh, Kevin will explain uh, most. The second one is looking good, which is related with making an impact with your personal image, but also with your behavior, because you must be a good professional and also you should appear in front of the others as the good <coughs> professional you are. And uh, when you're doing, so how do you act? Uh, is consistent with, with your looking, hmm? how do you appear? Then you are telling the truth and as a result, you are natural and authentic. Mm -hmm. And the third element uh, is uh, being good, which is related to personal character excellence, because it's not enough doing technically well and looking good, you also have to be a good person. Mm -hmm. And what is a good person? Mm -hmm. Is a person who lives by ethical principles and this is the main point of my research, and uh, it has a coincidence with the professor from Harvard, Howard Gardner, 
explains when he say, a bad person never gets to be a good professional. Hmm? Because without ethical principles, you can become rich, yes, or technically good, but not excellent. Hmm? And excellence is not an act, it's a habit, because we are what we, but what we repeatedly do. No? So trying to answer the question is, uh, I think they're expecting from us integrity and honesty, even though we, if we have a, a personal defects and also make a lot of mistakes, but they want us to be points of reference, persons who live the ethical principles we teach. Mm? And uh, the, essence, the essence of an authentic servant leadership is to serve others as they expect it to be served. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. <clears throat> Kevin Majors, uh, Dr. Kevin Majors, is a lecturer in psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, uh, where he trains psychiatry residents and medical students in behavioral therapy at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He has developed a not-for-profit mentoring program in Cambridge that focuses on helping college students achieve peak performance in their studies by applying the latest cognitive and behavioral approaches. He has also founded an educational website, overcomingcravings.com, to help people understand the cognitive behavioral approach to treating addictions. Kevin also has a private practice located in Cambridge. Kevin, how can we help millennials to enjoy working at their best and for the best motives? Well, thank you, Danilo, and thank you, Manuel, for having me here. And it's, it's really a great joy to be with these panelists, and I look forward to our future conversation. I'd start by saying that I think the strength of millennials is their capacity for high ideals that they are interested in making the world a better place, mm -hmm. they're interested in serving, they're interested in loving. And maybe the pitfalls that they face are that, one, they often don't know how to handle anxiety. Mm -hmm. So anxiety disorders are on the rise, and in my clinical practice, that's primarily what I treat. The other is distractedness. So I'm being able to you know, achieve high levels of focus. And the other is what goes into those is sometimes a reluctance to face challenge. Now, but I want to show how their capacity for high ideals will actually help them with those three things. So in my practice, in my mentoring, and as a therapist, and as a teacher, the most profound positive changes come when I help students to focus on their very way of working. The mode of working, what does it mean for them to focus at their highest level? At its best, work does embody ideals and sets us free from the control of impulses and distractions. Work channels adrenaline into excitement rather than anxiety and teaches us how to rise to any challenge. I think that everything really hinges on work. So the way we work is the way we live. So, and by improving the very way of working, and learning how to bring ideals into that, we become the best version of ourselves. So I teach students, and I would teach you all right now, actually, the, if you want to be achieving your highest level of focus, here's a simple model that will do that. Think of it as ready, set, go. <laughs> Before you start the task you're about to do, ready means that you ask yourself if you're viewing the task as a threat or as an opportunity. And reframing is the skill by which you consciously come to see it as an opportunity. An opportunity for growth, an opportunity for practice, ultimately an opportunity for ideals. Set means that you settle your mind. You let yourself become more mindful. Neurologically, this turns off the default mode network, which is the origin of repetitive intrusive thoughts that are actually the source of distractions. So distractedness is directly addressed by teaching people to recognize when they're getting distracted and to refocus in the present moment. And to learn to do that then until your attention has settled in the task and you're ready for step three, which is go. You set off in the challenge. So you try to have a very specific task with a specific time limit, something that will call forth intensity. What you're trying to do is one, get yourself out of threat mode you know, by reframing and by being mindful, you activate what's called the parasympathetic nervous system. 
and that is what allows for a singular focus. And then the challenge step is how you get adrenaline to help you. Ideals set the stage for all of that. So the first step called reframing is also called cognitive reappraisal. And that is a deliberate act of considering how what you're facing right now is an opportunity for some kind of growth or practice. And I would invite you even right now to be thinking of a task that you have coming up that you might be dreading or something that you're complaining about internally. Complaining and dreading are habits of negative appraisal that make the higher levels of attention unattainable. So no one can focus at their best when they're complaining or dreading. So if you're thinking specifically of a thing that you might be dreading, and then you ask yourself, what is the virtue or skill that would make that challenge easy for me? What is this giving you a very kind of privileged opportunity to practice? In work, that will often be achieving work itself with order, with intensity, with constancy, with creativity. So you, you approach the task as an opportunity to practice those qualities. <coughs> All of this applies then even more than work into your ordinary lives as um, in your family relationships, your social relationships. Is there any person that you are reluctant to deal with? Is there, are there someone you would dread being with or complain when you're with them? To think, what then is the precise thing I could be practicing while I'm with them? How could I instead see that as an opportunity to, to be more interested, engaging, loving, patient, kind? And so when people learn how to reframe and build, and you could say set the stage for very high quality work, they are simultaneously learning how to set the stage for virtue in any activity, in any setting. So work is the hinge on which everything turns. Work is the ultimate training ground for virtue. Thank you, Thank you Kevin. Dr. Richard Weisbord is currently a senior lecturer in education at the Harvard School, uh, the Harvard Graduate School of Education and at the Kennedy School of Government. He's also faculty director of the Human Development and Psychology Master's Program. His work focuses on vulnerability and resilience in childhood, the achievement gap, moral development, and effective schools and services for children. He directs the Making Caring Common Project, a national effort to make moral and social development priorities in child raising and to provide strategies to schools and parents for promoting children caring, a commitment to justice and other key moral and social capacities. He's currently conducting research on how older adults can better mentor young adults and teenagers in developing ethical, mature, romantic relationships. For several, several years, he worked as a psychologist in community mental health centers. He's a founder of several interventions for at-risk children. He has advised on the city, state, and federal levels on family policy and school reform, and has written for numerous scholarly and popular publications, and is the author of two books, The Vulnerable Child and, Par and The Parents We Mean to Be. Rick, are we preparing children in America to be caring ethical citizens, workers, and family members? Uh, well, thank you, and thank you, Manuel, for bringing us all together. It is wonderful to be here. It's, good morning, everyone. It's wonderful to be part of this group. Um, and I appreciate the question. Uh, so here's how I would answer it. I think that, you know, in, in some respects we are, but here's what my big concern is. We've been doing research over the last eight years where we ask versions of this question. I'm going to simplify the data, but one question that we've asked about 50,000 middle school and high school students um, at this point is, um, what's most important to you? Being achieving at a high level, being a happy person, or being a caring person? And we also spend a lot of time, what do you mean by caring? What do you mean by achievement? What do you mean by happiness? How do you see the relationship between caring and achievement and happiness? We also ask them, how do you imagine your parents would rank these things for you? So is it more important to your parents that you're caring, high achieving, or, or that um, you're happy? And how do you imagine your, your teachers would rank these things for you? Uh, you know, again, in a nutshell, and to simplify a lot of data, about um, when we do this, about 50% of students rank achievement first, they rank happiness, about 30% rank happiness first, and about 20% rank caring first. So about 80% of kids are ranking some aspect of their success, either achievement or happiness, 
as more important than their caring for other people. And I want you just to pause and consider how unprecedented that is, because I don't think that would, I'm going to explain to you why I think it's the case, but I don't think that would have been true at other times in our history. And I think it is one root of why we are living in such a fractured and polarized and, uh, and nasty and uncivil political and civic time in this country in, in many respects. And again, one root in, a, in, a, in one piece of a complex puzzle. When we ask parents what's most important to you in child raising, they say that our kids, that our kids are caring, and they rank achievement third. Um, when we ask kids, as I said, how do you imagine your parents would rank these things for you? What do you think kids say? Achievement. <laughs> so about 60% of kids think that they would rank their achievement first, and about 15% think that their parents would rank caring first. So, Kids are even more likely to think that their parents would rank achievement over caring. When we ask kids, um, is it more important to your parents that you get good grades in school or that you're a caring and contributing class member in school, uh, kids are about three times more likely to think that it's more important to their parents that they get good grades than that they're caring, contributing um, class members. And, 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 I'm, and I'm raising this for you because I think it's a reflection of the degree to which we have elevated achievement and happiness as the primary goals of child raising and demoted caring or, and concern for the common good. And that's, a, and that's a concerning development. And we spend a lot of time in schools and in homes trying to teach capacities um, like empathy, um, perspective taking, social awareness. But it's hard to do when we have demoted caring to the degree that we have, when we're out of balance. And you know, and I'm, and I'm speaking in big terms. I appreciate what um, a couple of you have said. You know, there are wonderful millennials out there with tremendous moral imaginations, very capable of moral idealism at high levels. But I am talking about a way in which we're out of balance. One of the things that makes this problem hard to solve is that when you ask parents, how do other parents in community rank achievement, caring, and happiness? <laughs> you can probably guess what they say. A large majority of parents think that a large majority of other parents would rank achievement over caring. So they think that um, about 70 or 75 percent of parents in their community would rank achievement over caring. So the situation we have is that a large majority of parents think the problem is a large majority of other parents. <laughs> um, that the problem is not me or the problem is not us. I think there are a few different causes of this. I mean, one is that through most of our history, it was mother's responsibility to raise children who were caring, responsible, in America, raise children who were caring, responsible citizens. It should have been fathers, too. That is no longer true. It's particularly not true in middle and upper class communities. And there are big race class culture differences in this that I probably won't have time to talk about, but happy to talk about offline. Um, schools in this country were founded to raise to develop children who would be good citizens. And that was true throughout much of their history. That is no longer true. Uh, that both public schools and private schools, universities like mine throughout most of their history stood for ethical values and were about promoting ethical character. When I asked um, Harvard students, we did a big survey of Harvard students, what values does Harvard stand for now? And when we talk to people outside the Harvard community, what values does Harvard stand for? I hear about excellence, I hear about success, I hear about elitism, sometimes I hear about truth, but very hard to find an ethical value. Our colleges and universities are no longer st standing for ethical values. I am not saying anything for or against religion. I mean, religion is complicated in lots of ways, but it can be a very important context for moral development. It is a community of adults who stand for ethical values often, who are engaging kids in ethical questions. There are rituals in communities like confirmations and bar mitzvahs that are asking kids to think about their responsibilities and obligations to their communities um, to, their, to their country, um, to the world. Um, many religions fuse a moral life and a spiritual life. You're asked to consider your obligations to your ancestors and your obligations to your descendants. And I'm not saying we should become more or less religious. I am saying that we should think about some of these functions of religious communities. I mean, how do we in secular life create communities of adults who are asking kids ethical questions? How do we recreate these rituals of gratitude and these coming of age ceremonies? How do we begin to fuse a moral life and a spiritual life um, for young people? I'm probably about to run out of time. So you have one minute. Yeah, so let me just say a couple things quickly about what we are trying to do about this. Um, we do a lot of work with the media. Um, with children's television shows, with ABC, with a number of major media stations, where we are trying to bring this to, to parents' attention, to schools' attention, and, 
everybody you know, I talk to is concerned about it. I mean, this has not been a hard sell in, in many ways. And actually trying to get parents and schools to, um, to reprioritize concern for others, concern for the common good. You know, we make some headway, we don't make headway. And encouraging days, discouraging days. The other thing we have doing is that college admissions, you know, the college admissions process is one of the few rites of passage that we have in this country. It's one of the few times in which adolescents are thinking about um, what they value and talking to adults, older adults, about what's valued in the, in the adult world. We came out with a report um, called Turning the Tide about a year ago um, in which got a lot of media attention and it was about colleges sending very diff different signals to kids. One is that and all the Ivy League schools signed it and that's one of the reasons, endorsed it, and that's one of the reasons that got a lot of attention. It now has almost 200 endorsers. I am gonna wind up in just a second. But it was an effort for colleges to send very different signals. And one signal is we really value ethical engagement. It's not about long brag sheets. It's not about the quantity of your achievements. It is about the quality of your intellectual engagement and it's about the kind of person you are today, day to day and whether you are a decent ethical citizen day to day. Let me stop there, thank you. Well, thank you, Rick, and thank you, uh, everyone, for your opening uh, remarks. And I would, at this point, like to um, <clears throat> invite the audience um, to ask uh, a short, uh, pointed question, to introduce themselves and ask a short question, with the suggestion that uh, perhaps you should ask uh, Rick a question, <laughs> because uh, Rick uh, won't be here for part two of the panel. <laughs> So if uh, uh, you have a question for Rick, I will call on you first, probably. And I'm, I'm getting eye contact already from a couple of people. So uh, yes, please, if you'd like to introduce yourself and then um, ask, ask the question. Thank you very much. Um, Would you mind introducing yourself? My name is yes. Paula Gutlove. I, uh, I started out as a surgeon and I now teach leadership and negotiation at the Simmons College School of Management, mm. uh, which has had the mission of empowering women for principled leadership. So it's the number one MBA program for women in the United Tremendous. States. Tremendous. So my <laughs> question to Rick is, is there a gender difference in the way millennials or the, the students you observe uh, care, uh, rank, achievement, happiness, and caring? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. And you know, as I said, in the interest of time, I did not talk about race, class, culture, or gender differences in this data, and they're important. So um, uh, women are girls, I mean, these are teen, primarily a teen middle school and high school students, um, are, are less likely than men to prioritize um, achievement over caring, um, but not by a lot. I mean, statistically different, but not by a lot. Um, you know, you do worry about different kids. I mean, I, you know, I worry about some kids being too organized around other people, and I especially worry about girls for whom the issue is not. I mean, I think one of the things going on in the culture right now, and this is, we have a report coming out about this, is that the more girls are um, out performing boys in school, outnumbering them in college, outpacing them in many cases in the workplace, the more subordinate and misog the more subordinate they appear to be in their romantic and sexual relationships, and um, the more vulnerable they appear to be to misogyny of different kinds. So I think there's a real issue around girls, around you know, being self-assertive. It's not about, you know, so I think you're very right to ask the question, very important question. In about a month or so, yeah, and I'd love to share it with you if you're interested, yeah. Yes, the gentleman by the window, yes. Yeah, I have a question. I have a 14-year-old and a 13-year-old daughters, and um, one of the, uh, it, it is, it's a, 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 a trope as old as the millennia that parents look at their kids' cultural preferences and are aghast by it, but I- They, I, they look at their- their, their cultural interests, you know, and, and in particular, um, uh, I'm, I'm referring to music, you know, and every parent's always complaining about their kid's music. Yeah. And yet, what, what I do think is different this, about right? the, the music that our, my, my kids listen to, and it's, it's typical of their age group, is that um, it's full of extreme uh, vulgarity, uh, bad words, uh, violent images, and uh, 
seems quite, it seems very offensive, actually. And, and uh, somehow I feel that this is symptomatic of a cultural phenomenon uh, that they are inheriting in, uh, as part of their generation. And I don't, I don't want to try to control it because I think it's too big, but, but I wonder what that says about our, our culture and what we should be doing about it, if anything. Um, so this is, a, this is a great question. I mean, he, he, here's what I would, would say about it. And, and uh, I think there's a, a, a really big issue that you're, you're pointing to here, and it's related to the comment that I just made about misogyny. Um, uh, Kevin was making the case everything hinges on w work. I'm going to make the case just, I mean, not to pick a fight, but I think, I, I think everything hinges on love, or love and work. <laughs> I agree. Work and love. <laughs> <We've> <laughs> <laughs> um, and I think we, um, just in relation to your comment about songs, um, I think we do a miserable job preparing young people to have caring, ethical, generous, subtle, romantic relationships, mm -hmm. and preparing people for love, or to have caring, mutually gratifying sex. And because we do such a miserable job, because parents don't want to have this conversation with their kids, because schools are skittish about having this conversation with kids, because sex ed is such a, it's so ridiculous in this country, and it is truly ridiculous, we have created this vacuum that is often filled, that is often filled by songs and cultural images and, and the media in different ways, by shows like The Bachelor, by mis that songs have had misogynistic lyrics that are concerning. I also appreciate your first point. This is not a new thing. Parents have always complained about this. But th a lot of these songs are vile. I won't repeat the lyrics, but they're really vile. Um, and so, you know, it is very concerning. You know, we also have, I'm sorry, I'm giving you too long an answer, but we also have this really problem, this very big problem of middle school and high school kids who are binging on porn. I mean, this is a real thing. I mean, there are middle school students in the back of the room with their smartphones who are watching porn, and quite a lot of it. Um, you know, I worry about that more than misogynistic songs. Um, and, you know, sooner or later we have to be able to say, we've got to take control of this. I mean, we have to do serious sex ed in this country. We have to talk to people about how you form caring ethical relationships. I mean, the tides are, the media tides are strong about this, and I feel like we need a counter narrative. We really got to fight it in some way. I don't know what else to do. I think Leon wanted to add to this. Uh, well, no, answer. I just yeah. wanted to comment that, you know, Rock and roll was considered the devil's music and was going to destroy the world, and we're still here. So it has been around for a long time, but I think Rick's point is the failure lies in the parents and the community that don't do anything. And so this fills a vacuum. It becomes all that they see. And like, I know you're lying. I see your lips moving. If that's the world that fills your life, that's the world you become, and it's the failure of schools, of parents, of others, to provide the role model of how to deal with it. Not to pontificate, but how do you deal with it? How do you deal with it on a day-to-day -day basis? What does it look like if you want to be a caring person and this is what you get on the internet? Let's talk about it. Let's sit down and let me show you. Uh, my name is Alejandro Cañadas. I teach at Mount St. Mary's University. Um, and may, This is for all of you, but um, Richard, you mentioned the role of um, religious communities as a civil society and how important it is because it's filling this, um, this, this hole, right? And I was wondering, in your research, do you, do you have data that maybe those communities or maybe educational institutions that they have this religious uh, connotation, do they rank those, um, what, what you mentioned about achieving happiness and caring in a different way than the others, or there is no difference even, even though they are religious? Yeah, no, it's a, it's, a, it's a great question. And just to clarify what, is, what I was saying, I was not saying we should become more religious. No. I was saying we should think yes. about these they, they fu a, functions of, yeah. re, of religious communities. Um, it's, a, it's sort of like the data on girls they, and women. They are religious communities. People in religious communities are more likely to say caring, not by a lot, but, but modestly more likely to say caring. I have no idea about that. We, we have no assessment here of, their, of anybody's behavior or actions. So I have no idea whether they're more likely to act caring day to day, just to be clear about that. So I can't answer that question. But in terms of what they espouse, you, you, you do see more. Say one teeny yes, weeny of course, thing. yeah. Just teeny, because I, I want to say something about doing it because it's right. When I, when I introduce the 10 elements of dignity and tell people that they 
um, you know, this is how you honor someone's sense of value and worth, people say to me, oh, that's just the golden rule. And I say, no, it's not the golden rule. It's not do unto others as you would want done unto you. You're doing unto others because it's the right thing to do. It's really based on principle, because who knows how you want to be treated? I mean, there can be some r rather strange and uh, twisted people who you know, want to be treated in a certain way, and they think, OK, I can treat other people that way. You do it. You honor people's dignity because it's the right thing to do. It's a principled decision. That's and it. Leon wanted to. Ah. Yeah. I just wanted to comment with your data that shows that the students see achievement higher than the parents see it and raise the question of whether what you're seeing in the students is a reflection of the parent behavior. <laughs> yeah, and so I think it's a great question, and I think you're e exactly right. And I think about my own parenting and the amount of time, you know, the amount of time we talked about achievement at the dinner table. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, my kids knew I was in this field, and, and yet, it, um, you know, and, and little things, not requiring them to reach out to friendless kids on the playground or to write thank you notes sometimes, or sometimes when they were busy, not requiring them to be respectful. It's like in all these little things, in all these little ways. I just want to say one quick, quick, quick story. We were interviewing a couple who, um, I was interviewing a couple who, who were deciding whether the daughter should quit the soccer team. She was a junior in high school. And the mother said, let her quit. She's not having any fun anymore. And the father said, but she's a great so soccer player. It's going to be great for her college resume. And you know, I realized at one point that neither of them said, does she have any obligation to the team? So I'm talking to my wife a few weeks later, and I said, my daughter's, my daughter's in a dance group, and I said to my wife, um, she's in this dance group, she's not any fun, let her quit. And my wife says something snarky, like, excuse me, Mr. Moral Development, you know, we can't just let her quit this, this dance group. She has, she has to at least think about, does she have some obligation to this group before she quit? <laughs> And, and, you know, and I study this stuff all the time. It's your point. It's so in the water, I think, in our parents. But, but the other I want to write, because one of the challenges we face is the parents will say, I am caring. And how do you get them to see, yes, you are caring, and yes, you behave in a way that doesn't transmit caring? That's true for all of us. One of the challenges I found in medicine is if you interview patients, their doctors are wonderful, but physicians are terribly dishonest people. Yeah. That doesn't follow sometimes. And physicians who say, everyone else takes gifts and is affected by them, but not me. Yeah. It's our inability sometimes to have the insight to see ourselves. And how do we overcome that? Because some of this teaching or learning isn't going to occur until somebody admits, actually, I do need to change. I wanted to say something very, you know, I, I think these are this is a wonderful question that, I, that we struggle with all the time and we, and we don't really know the answer. I mean, you know, we are, trying to give, we are trying to show parents the data that you keep blaming other people and not looking at yourself. We are also giving them examples of some of these little ways in which you might be prioritizing and red flags for them about this. It's hard to know how much this is working. It's a great question. We're at this. Yeah. Thank you very much. We reconvene in 30 minutes. OK, welcome back. Um, and I believe uh, the first question comes from um, uh, the Consul General in Boston. Yes. So. Thank you. Uh, I find the, the issue that has been uh, debated uh, quite uh, fascinating and very interesting. Now, my question would be, I think we have a, a phrase uh, saying in Spanish and English, which is more or less the same. You, you have, uh, when you are in, in, in trouble, you have to bring, bring, uh, bring virtue out of necessity. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, we, we have the, the very same uh, sentence, hacer de la necesidad virtud. Wouldn't you think uh, this applies? I mean, uh, uh, sometimes you don't control what uh, is going to happen to you. You have... Uh, uh, I think it was Machiavelli who said that uh, you can control perhaps half of what is uh, going to happen to you, but then there is the other half. So sometimes this conflict uh, uh, between achievement and ethics is something that is imposed on you. It's not something that you um, create uh, in order to be good, no? And uh, well, I, I'd like to to, to see what you think about uh, this uh, old saying we have in English and, uh, and in Spanish. Well, if I can jump in then to respond. 
I, I think that the mistake that's often made in parenting and teaching is trying to protect the person from challenge, trying to protect them in a sense from necessity. So, but without the necessity, without the challenge element, then there's no way to be growing and rising. And so in each necessity, people, what they need to do is see how to commit themselves to the best path, which is shown by ideals and values and, and these concepts we're hearing about here today. And then being patient and accepting of the internal difficulty. So you might feel like behaving in a rude way, you might have an impulse to do that, but you rise to the occasion and you behave kindly. So but that's the real shaping of virtue in necessity. Uh, I think that <clears throat> you're right. A lot of times virtue is necessitated by challenges that arise. The problem that we've seen over decades is some people don't respond to it with virtue. Um, and I think that's where you try and get more role models who uh, we can't change the challenges. They will arise. They're going to be there. They're going to be surprises. It's helping students and even uh, people we work with um, to stop and pause. There are vir virtuous or ethical challenges in everything we do. There's an interesting book that was written about healthcare called The Ethics of the Everyday and points out that even in the simplest act, every day and every moment, we have moral challenges. You're a physician. There's a patient sitting in front of you who's starting to complain and cry and has a de really deep problem. You have a waiting room full of people and they're gonna be delayed. You make a decision in an instant, but there were moral factors that came into play. Compassion, obligation to others. Um, how do you deal with that? So I think, yes, the challenges raise the opportunity to apply virtue to your decision the challenge for teachers sometimes is how do we educate people so when they're faced with the challenge, they do apply virtue and don't slip into, I think that's why a lot of times people said business ethics is an oxymoron. I'm in business, I don't have to worry about ethics, that's my compartment. I'm in law, I'm not obligated to be ethical and moral because I have my own code that says I'll act only for my client. Yes, it's true in part, but it also is a for lack of a better term, a cop-out to hide behind that sort of, you know, this is business, not ethics. This is law, not ethics. Um, so far, if I can uh, assert my prerogative of a moderator and ask a question uh, here, um, it seems to me that I think all of the panelists focused on uh, the virtue aspect as the solution to the uh, uh, problems in ethical leadership or, or lack of good formation. Uh, of our of our students, or how to uh, supplement millennials' formation in good ways. But I wonder if, as a political scientist now and scholar of institutions, whether we can maybe step back and see if there are any questions of, or any answers in institutional design. In other words, of course, I think virtue is necessary, and uh, there's never enough of it. It certainly seems like it, and it's not one of those things that's limited. But what about institutional design? Famously. The origins of the American Republic, James Madison, uh, and the Federalist, famous Federalist Papers asserted that institutional design uh, can actually, you know, checks, of, checks and balances uh, can actually solve the problems of lack of virtue in, in some instances or insufficient virtue. Can we think about that in a business set setting or in a other other settings as well, Donna? <clears throat> well, I'm not. I don't use the language of virtue. It's not my, I'm not comfortable with it because I don't really know it um, as well as my panelists here. But I can tell you that, um, especially in, in institutional design, one of the things that I promote in my work in trying to establish in institutions what I call a culture of dignity. And so what does that mean? So that means to me that um, in a culture of dignity, Everyone has to be on board. Everyone has to be involved. It's not just teaching um, how to treat other people as if they matter, you know, as an academic exercise. This is something that every single person who is involved in the institution has to be educated in. They have to understand all the basic building blocks of dignity. And I, 
can't go into them now. I mean, it's the whole book is about that. Um, but it, there are there's so much that we have to learn, that we have to understand and know about dignity. It is the most um, neglected topic, I think, in, in academia. And um, so if you can establish a culture of dignity where the leadership is on board, number one, first and foremost, the leadership has to, like Leon says, walk the talk, model that kind of behavior, and it's a conscious, it has to be, I mean, I have people sign contracts when I go into an organization. They sign a contract that if they're going to create a culture of dignity, they have to do X, Y, and Z in order to fulfill that. And it's an ongoing process. I mean, Leon, I think we're, we're thinking in very similar ways. Um, I did a remarkable um, intervention in a hospital right here, Mount Auburn Hospital. They wanted to establish a culture of dignity right here. And so it's, it's really about an educational approach to having people feel like they're valued in the, in the organization. And the other key to this, and I'm sorry Rick is gone, because what, the, what I'm um, showing is that when people understand dignity, they treat each other with dignity, they have that as a guiding principle of, their, of the way they are in relationship with one another, then this actually promotes human development. People feel, when people feel safe and they feel like they can you know, they're not going to be humiliated or shamed in their work environment when they feel safe, mm -hmm. that it opens themselves up to <coughs> learning and creativity. So, I mean, I see it as a, an imperative at this point, um, so. I mean, the, you're right, there are <coughs> structural and organizational things, and that's one of the challenges as a compliance officer when people would think about how do you introduce compliance and ethics into an organization is first the realization there are bad people in the organization, they are going to do bad things, and that's just gonna happen. There are also good people you want to do good things. Okay, how do you design the organization and structure so you maximize the good behavior people and allow them to do what they would normally do, mm -hmm. and you minimize the opportunities and ability for people who would like to be bad to be bad? And there are structural things you can do. It can be contracts, it's also, having everybody in the organization understand that we don't do this once. We're not gonna create a caring and an organization with dignity on Thursday, sign a contract and thank you, we're done. Yeah. No, it's gonna go on day after day and it's gonna be hard and it's gonna be demoralizing at times, but the CEO and everybody have to be behind it. They have to bring it up um, you know, and also need to really seek out and look for the informal structure and culture. I'm always reminded when I was a student and the professor who said there's no such thing as a stupid question. And there wasn't until the first person asked it on that first day. And it was very clear that there were things that someone considered stupid. Uh, so, <laughs> you, you know, there are a lot of things being said in organizations and then you have to it's very hard for organizations and for individuals to look at themselves and look in the mirror and say, you know, uh, I'm getting older. Things are different. I'm changing. This is not the way it was supposed to be. So, Leon, I, I want to say that what my experience is that there are bad people and good people. Yeah, right. And good people without dignity consciousness can do great harm. Mm, yes. So it is, so Absolutely. you don't have to be a good person uh, in order to be, uh, you know, promote dignity. It, the, uh, the ignorance around this issue is encyclopedic. It really is. So even good people, you know? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, we have uh, seven or eight hands. Uh, the, the lady in the, in the middle row, if, uh, if, uh, if you, yeah, and we'll I take it. I could ask my stupid question. Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, my name is Madeline Snow. I'm at the Lowell Center for Sustainable Production at the University of Massachusetts in Lowell. And I just want to bring up the, the issue we've been talking really about caring, meaning caring about people. And I just want to raise the issue of caring about things or ideals. So the younger generation is very much committed to and cares about environmental protection mm -hmm. or climate change, but perhaps really don't necessarily care about their elderly parents and the nursing home to visit, et cetera. So I just want to bring this up mm -hmm. caring for individuals or caring for an ideal or a concept. Mm -hmm. Well, I could, I could say that the, um, the way ideals kind of elevate, the, I think, the way that we approach work 
is by turning it into an opportunity to be patterning ourselves and shaping ourselves. But ultimately, those ideals have to involve loving other people. And I guess, and even beyond that, loving love itself. So that there, the, if you stop with things, you're just looking at results or products. But even that's not fulfilling in terms of uh, you know, what you want out of work. If you're just getting things or products, you're not really growing. So ultimately, it has to be about, I would say, when it comes to professional work, that you want to not just do this task really well, but you want to be able to aim at really working at your very best, so you love working at your best. Mm -hmm. But even that has to have a higher ordination to, you love working at your best for the service of others, for the good of others, and so and for love. And that's where work then becomes a pattern for the rest of life, but it has to open up into the real relationships. In behavioral therapy, when we're talking about ideals, it's always in the first place in terms of relationships. I have an answer. Um, <laughs> you won't be able to shut me up once you start with this, but uh, Madeline, you know, I have developed something uh, recently that I call the three C's of dignity. The dignity is about three things. It's about connection, connection, and connection. <laughs> and so the first connection, that if you really have an understanding of dignity, you know that you're worthy no matter what. So the first connection is to your own dignity. I am worthy. This I learned from Nelson Mandela. The second connection is to my uh, knowing that others, people, if I have dignity, then so does everybody else. And so the uh, actively promoting dignity means that you treat yourself as if you're valuable, you treat others. And then the third connection is what I think related to what Kevin is talking about, is a connection to something greater than yourself. So, you know, young people really want that, that mission, that, that sense of purpose and sense of meaning. And that's wonderful. I mean, I think that's where they do have the advantage many times over, over our experiences. But, the, but what I'm saying about dignity is if any of those connections is severed, any one of them, you're going to suffer. So we need those three connections. And, and I love the concept of love, and I'm integrating it into my new book, actually, because at the end of the day, I think dignity really is about love. If you want to show someone a lo love, treat them with dignity. Mm -hmm. so. And we have this a question. Man, you know what, the nail of this guy here, he's been having, he's yeah. had his hand up for the last, yeah. even since the time before. OK, I, I, yeah. I, I didn't notice it. He, do, he doesn't have the mic, so we'll make an exception. Yeah, exactly. And then we'll Sorry, go to Millennial after that. I, I appreciate that. Um, my name is uh, John Sherman, uh, and I'm uh, uh, general counsel and uh, senior advisor to an NGO called SHIFT, uh, which is uh, dedicated to the implementation of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights. Um, and uh, I'm also a, a senior program fellow at the uh, Kennedy School and, uh, and a Kalman executive fellow. Um, and I have a very, very short question which picks up on what uh, Leon said about modeling behavior uh, for purposes of teaching ethics, both to millennials and within businesses, what are the challenges that we face in the era of Trump and how do we overcome them? <coughs> this is something that I wrestle with when I talk to businesses uh, every day and uh, since we've got all these ethical people in the room <laughs> and on the panel, help. Mm. Help me deal with this. Thank you. you know, I think that um, one I alluded to is we have to find examples of how good behavior pay off. We ha and that's difficult to do sometimes. It's like asking the compliance officer, show us you're effective, and your answer is, well, we're not in trouble, isn't that, you know, I worked. Um, finding examples of really positive events are difficult. That's why the negative events are so, they're exciting, they're like a reality show. Um, so it's the hard work of finding them, but also when given the opportunity of modeling the behavior within yourself or finding CEOs who model it, um, and helping set up the conversations with leaders and students where they can have a conversation that really is a very basic. How do you CEO deal with the fact that you have to have good results every quarter? That's a lot of pressure. 
how do you deal with that and still be, for lack of a better word, ethical or virtuous or whatever you want to say? Those are the conversations that have to be had and somehow schools have to stimulate them or get CEOs. It would be nice. When you finish medical school, you take an oath. I took the oath of Hippocrates. One of the things in the oath is your obligation to train the next generation. That is an absolute obligation that you take an oath to do. Be nice to do that for all CEOs and obligate them or have a sign a contract in which they will train the next generation of CEOs and they will be willing to spend the time. Now, you can't really get them to sign an oath. So. But I think to find the CEOs who are interested, who are engaged and would like to have the conversation uh, you're right, the era of Trump is going to make it very difficult because that role model and the role model of everyone around him, um, you know, at best is a negative role model and, but maybe good for psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> we are, we're seeing an uptake. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to, um, I want to um, champion a, uh, a movement that's happening now in the uh, business community among business ethicists and business management. It's called the Humanistic Management Network. Mm -hmm. And Sandra uh, and other people here perhaps are also involved. And the whole idea is that they're challenging this notion of the traditional business model, which is that you know, the, the goal is for profit in maximization and shareholder um, ma uh, profit maximization in particular. And this group of, of uh, business ethicists, Michael Pearson, and um, well, you're, you're involved in this now. He actually gave a talk here a couple of years ago. But the idea is that instead of the focus being on profit maximization, uh, the out outcome of the business model, the focus is on promotion of well-being and, hum and human dignity. And every, you, it, the shifting that dynamic is really quite powerful because um, not only does it improve you know, the bottom line, but people are happier. There's a sense that their work is meaningful, like you were saying. They, were, they, they have a purpose in life that they can align themselves with. That's the bigger mission of the organization. So promoting human dignity, and it's all the way down the supply chain. We're not just talking about within the organization. We're talking, or the company. We're talking about the relationship between the company and the suppliers and everything. So it's, it's really quite powerful. And I think that's the antidote, to tell you the truth. I don't think we're going to be able to touch Trump. I, I really don't. I have, I'm very pessimistic about changing that man's behavior. I, I don't see it happening in our lifetimes. But, uh, but I do think we can come up with an alternative that we can really promote, we can champion. Right, Sandra? Um, we're we're, we're in, this, in on this one together. So I, I, I think that's the best we can do, frankly. And, and I believe Sandra's holding the microphone. Is oh, that, is that oh Kevin, to. sorry. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, Kevin, please. But I, 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 mm -hmm. this, this has to be, then, a perfect opportunity for reframing. Yeah. So, <laughs> and, and to be thinking of what is the best opportunity the situation is providing. I think that it does highlight the, the, the need for role models. Uh, and the, when people face challenges, particularly challenges they, they think are beyond them, they're looking, they, they try to draw upon what resources they have. And one of the primary sources for ideals is having a clear role model. And so there, there need to be examples in the people who are rising to the challenge mm -hmm. and where this is, you can say, bringing out the best in them. And that's, I think, what the others are speaking to. Yeah, yeah no, that's very good. Yeah. And yes. I think just to piggyback on what Rita had said in the beginning, it's the teachers the behavior she describes for teachers is a role model for how to be an ethical and virtuous teacher and an ethical and virtuous person in the world of business. And I think those points are well you know, important. If I could just make a follow-up, you know, this is probably out of order. One example of what you just said, sorry. One example of what you just said was the employee-driven response to the first executive order resulting in the filing of an amicus brief by 175 companies basically saying that uh, doing uh, the executive order was contrary to their core values of inclusion and diversity, mm -hmm. uh, to protecting their own people. And, and uh, to me, that's exactly what, what you're talking about. Thank you for that. Uh, Sandra, do you have a microphone there? Uh, you know, okay, so. Uh, she, yeah. 
Yeah, he's next. Yeah. Hi, Sandra Waddock from Boston College. Um, I, yeah, I'll just, I had a question actually, but I wanted to speak to Donna's uh, comment about the or, uh, effort she's talking about. It's called Leading for Wellbeing, and it's headed by Michael Pearson and Hunter Lovins and a few other folks. And the idea is to create a new narrative around the roles of business and society and the functioning and really focus in on the, the issues that Donna was talking about. I think it's really important and it's got an international coalition of folks behind it. Um, and I would urge everybody to, they have a website, if you Google Leading for Wellbeing, it should come up. Um, and there's an invitation on that website to become involved. So, mm -hmm. um, Can I ask my question? <laughs> of course. <laughs> so we've been having a conversation for the past several years at Boston College about the lack of resilience among our current students. And I can't remember who it was. One of you mentioned resilience. Um, um, one of you mentioned fear. Uh, the students coming in with a lot of anxiety and fear. And that was, we had a speaker who basically said, if she was to characterize, I think she was talking about the uh, generation coming, not, not so much the millennials, but fear was the one word that she would use. And in this context um, of fear and uh, how do we, and it's, I think it's fear of failure because I think I was realizing today how much I pushed uh, performance onto my son in light of the comments, um, <laughs> and thinking, oh my God, to the how do we how do we promote caring as being success? That is being successful. It's not you're successful or you're caring. It's it's that you have to do all of that. How do we deal with this lack of resilience, the inability to face challenges, the unwillingness to quote unquote fail at something among our students? No, I was just going to say. It too. Kevin said, uh, this is really a matter of reframing. And a reframing what for the parent or the person, the teacher, is success for the student. Um, regardless of what we say, unless we really do respond, and I know just it's a very personal thing that my son, you know, we sent him to college for five years, and now he's doing nothing related to that, and his mother and even his father aren't necessarily happy with what he's doing, but... <laughs> The fact is he's successful and he's happy. And that should be what we care about and that should be reflected in how we interact and respond to him or to the students. The problem is that when students are applying to college or everything else, it really is driven by you got to get into the best school. I mean, I see people, I know young people applying and they apply to 40 colleges. I mean, when I applied to college, I did four just because that's, you know, what you did. Um, and I think that some, and I don't know how you change and help people reframe their world, but if we really do believe, mm -hmm. um, there was a lecture at Bentley, and I forget the professor's name, talking about what's the purpose of business. And he reframed it, not from the purpose of business as maximization of shareholder profit, but the purpose of business is betterment of society. Mm, should be. Mm -hmm. And in that view, a lot changes about what you look at for businesses and what's success. Um, I don't know the answer, but I know that this is a large challenge for our society about reframing and helping parents and leaders and everything else be comfortable as they reframe their view of the world and what success is. I think, I think in cognitive behavioral therapy, we would say that success and status are safety strategies meant to protect people from future fear or bad emotions. So the fundamental thing is the unwillingness to feel bad. And then they try to prevent it by getting more power, more money, more accomplishments. Uh, as long as that's the case, those activities will be unfulfilling for them. So because what they're doing is they're trying to get rid of a negative stimulus through the certain behavior that reinforces the behavior and that's what causes vicious cycles where they need more and more status and success and wealth in order to protect themselves is never enough. <laughs> so, and that's the problem with having the negative kind of happiness that Rick was talking about earlier. Yeah, the, uh, on, the, on the positive end, what you try to do is to help people chart the course based on their values and, you know, and ideals, being able to tolerate the discomfort, welcome the discomfort. It's seeing discomfort itself as a sign of growth because you only get it while you're on the right path and while you're growing. 
-hmm. so that you, but the, the direction of growth has to be something that is so high that it's not fully ever attainable, yet it does guide your present behavior. And that's what are called ideals or values. That there are, you can never be fully loving, fully understanding, fully compassionate, but it can guide your behavior right now in very concrete ways. And so that's how we direct ourselves to it. Welcoming and tolerating whatever momentary discomfort or fear of shame there might be. Yeah, I was going to say, it's, I think it's fear of humiliation, yeah, actually. Exactly, shame um, so I read a fascinating book. Um, I just finished it, and it's called Born to Love. You'll like mm -hmm, this yeah. one. Do you know that one by Bruce Perry? Yeah, I've heard of it. Yeah. Oh, okay. So it's called Born to Love. And what Bruce Perry, uh, the neuroscientist, wrote about was how young children, especially recent, in the recent last couple of decades, the parenting of young children has been to protect them from these challenges, as Kevin pointed out, that you're, always, you're hovering to protect them so that they don't experience any of those negative feelings. Or, and Bruce Perry said that this is a major problem because the, he talks about the stress response system in our brain needs to feel and experience some um, bad feelings in order to develop empathy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was absolutely fascinating to me. And without that, what happens is we're, we're developing kids who think that they have to have someone come and rescue them. Every single, so they, don't, they haven't developed any tolerance for discomfort. And I want to say something about resilience, too, um, Sandra, because I think resilience, once you know, and I've learned this personally, and I've, I know it um, from working with people, that once people, kids understand, especially kids, that they are worthy no matter what. I mean, they may be, do bad things and all of that, but and pe some people may treat them really badly and they end up feeling bad, but just because you feel bad doesn't mean you are bad. And if you have a sense of your own inherent self-worth, this is the first C, that creates a sense of resilience that I think is unbeatable. So when kids know I am worthy no matter what, somebody can treat me badly, and even then, I'm still, I'm still worthy. So I think that there is an epidemic. I go all over the world talking about these dignity, uh, this dignity work, and I can tell you that the vast majority of people with whom I work don't have a first, th that first C. They don't know their inherent value and worth, and they're working on all these externalities to prove that they're worthy. Uh, this next promotion, the good job, the A on the paper, the, and that's, that's what I call false dignity because you're relying on external reasons for, to define your sense of worth. So I think we're, we, we, that's, there's an epidemic. Yes. Another excellent book along the lines of Born to Love is uh, Donna Pincus at Boston University has a book called Growing Up Brave. Oh, I like that. And it's a phenomenal book. And <coughs> the simplest treatment for an anxiety disorder in a child is five minutes a day of loving attention. Mm -hmm. where the parent just attends to the child because attention is the currency of love. So the parent just attends to the child without questions, without criticisms or commands. So, and, and they can be mirroring what the child is doing, they can be interested, they can be praising, but that's it. And it's extremely hard oftentimes for the, the parents of kids who have anxiety to go five minutes without criticisms or compl and so you get to see how things get passed down. <laughs> uh, and so, but the affirmation of their own, their own dignity and their own worth that they get through just parental attention lovingly given, exactly. five minutes a day is a robust treatment. And crazy making is when the kids are told, oh, I love you, and yet there's no time with them, there's no attention, no, exactly. there's no, and how, I mean, this is like a real popular thing now saying, oh, I love you every five seconds, right? Yeah. <laughs> so it, it's, it's show, don't tell. Exactly. Show, That's don't right. tell, basically. Yes, in the back. <clears throat> uh, thank you for all the panel. Uh, I, I was told to introduce myself. My name is Desmond. I'm currently doing a Master of Laws at the law school, and I'm very happy to be one of the token millennials in the room. <laughs> uh, social justice, liberty, dignity, for me, have all become buzzwords. And really, except in certain contexts, nothing more. There was an extremely well done theatrical production at the law school. I've only here for one year, so it's the first time I saw it. It was called The Parody, where apparently students stop taking class and write a theatrical performance. It was spectacular. One of the jokes there was that Justice Kennedy appeared, and they asked him how to solve a problem, and he said, dignity, and disappeared. 
And I think that really kind of goes to how at the highest levels of intellectual thought in this country in particular, we're, we're just comfortable with kind of referring to these words and being happy that they mean something positive in a vague esoteric sense. But I would ask the panel in general, how do we address this issue of relativism in the currency which we use to talk about ethics? And I would then want to start off with asking Donna to tell me how do we make dignity a concrete and universal idea and not just a buzzword? So you gotta read my book. So <laughs> I've come up with 10 ways. Uh, I, I've basically operationalized dignity in this book. Um, and uh, in case you, you know, it's, it's actually up to, uh, in the window at Harvard Bookstore. My, 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 um, my publisher said, Donna, you have to be shameless about promoting this book. So there it is. Um, but so 10 ways I've operationalized. So if you want to honor somebody's dignity, you accept their identity no matter who they are. You show them recognition. You acknowledge their being. You treat them fairly. You make sure you don't, you, you grant them independence and autonomy. You, you promote understanding. You try to get deeper understanding of the person. You give them the benefit of the doubt. Um, you create safety for that person. And you hold yourself accountable if you violate someone's dignity. So that's just in a nutshell. But I want to say something about this dignity. You know, it's so true. It gets called up so frequently. And usually it's dignity and respect, as if that's one word. And those are not the same things. But it's a disembodied concept, the way dignity is treated, without understanding how it affects us on a daily basis. So I'm trying to put the body back in, in the disembodied analytical concept of dignity. And my, that's, the whole book is about that, how, how to make it a way of life, rather than just a concept that we can say, liberté, égalité, fraternité, right? So. I think the challenge for the students in the class not this class, but in any class, is when that happens. Dignity is a buzzword. Someone, and it's, I'm not saying it's easy to do. Is the question that goes back to the teacher is, what does dignity look like in the situation you're describing? Well, it's dignity. No, what does it look like? Do I smile? Does it, do, I, do I spend time? The problem often is people, you're right, they're buzzwords, they're easy to use, difficult to do, and worst of all, they require that you spend extra time and you know, you've got your 55 minutes or 50 or whatever it is for the class. You've got to get so many classes done. You've got to finish the syllabus. Um, you've got to get your quarter done. You've got to get your profits in, whatever. There's so many other things going on that it's very easy and often I think it's very human to say, I'll get to that later. Um, that alone, for me, is becoming more and more the alarm. I'll get to it later as an alarm that something's wrong. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, Very good. I'd also just chime in and say that I think the, so the, the concept of the golden rule came up earlier. And that's actually, I think, a thought experiment for people to think objectively, what would it look like for someone to be treating me well so that they can use that as an exemplar for how they treat others? And in that sense, no one's actually relativist when it comes to how others treat them. <laughs> you know, they have very clear principles. And the idea is then holding people to those high principles so that rather than just expecting them from others, they're then holding themselves up to that. Uh, I think one, one idea uh, is the three elements that I mentioned before, the, you're uh, doing well, so you have to, to know very well your staff, you have to be a very good professional, and also looking good, so you have to appear in front of the others that you are a very good professional. It's very important, but also the alignment with the dimension of being good, to be a good person. So the consistency and the coherence between the three elements, I think this is, uh, the results is, is a very profound personal unity of life and the, your personal reputation is based on this, uh, the coherence between the three, these three elements. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's a way mm -hmm. to start. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's open. I'm Maria Hajpavlu from the University of Cyprus. Um, and I come from a family of five uh, sisters and one brother. And my father believed very much in education. So he used to tell us that uh, when uh, you educate a girl, you educate many, 
but when you educate a boy, you educate one. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I used to you know, wonder what he meant. And I think coming back to gender and also caring, the concept of caring, uh, it developed in us, you know, this obligation that whatever we learn, we have to share. Uh, and sharing it meant in the family, but then with your, your own children, etc. But he didn't tell the same thing to my brother. <laughs> so, yeah, so this became a very big conversation. So coming back to how caring, you know, that it's a women's value. And also, I think, uh, living in a world which is very patriarchal and very hierarchical, we did uh, hierarchize also values. You know, what are men's values and what are women's values? And usually, women's values were, and very, in my country, that was still very patriarchal, uh, women's values, including all the values we've mentioned here and are considered to be soft values, okay? They are not the ones that have to do with competitiveness, with achievement, and so on. So I really need, we are in need of unlearning many things in the, our type of uh, system. We socialize both uh, the new generations, but also uh, re frame the whole system um, and the culture. But at this, my question is, um, and also how do we measure success? I mean, um, I just, parenthesis, say that um, in Cyprus we did a project to address what is a successful person. And we concentrated on women, because few women, you know, we are visible, everybody knows. So we looked at those cases of women who are invisible, but make a lot of social change with their interventions in the workplace, in the um, family, in the community, especially bringing down social taboos. So I think we have to revisit and reframe, as you were saying, a lot of these concepts that we are socialized into, you know, thinking that they are uh, the ones that we need all to aspire to and bring the invisible connotations and values uh, of, of such concepts. And also power. For me, power is another concept we need to revisit in all the... So two questions. One is, uh, when Donna mentioned about the three Cs, which I value and I accept, I think one thing that is important for us in self-growth is also sometimes to um, ask the question, what is the intention behind what I'm really uh, doing you know, with the other, sharing and so on? Does this... Does this intention going to reinforce my first C, you know, and make me feel really good and so on? So how do we uh, uh, also be aware of that in order to reach the third C? And the second question to all is, what I how do we integrate what we are speaking here in the mainstream curricula, especially in programs and um, educational systems that are extremely um, uh, centralized and controlled. Well, that's a, <laughs> a great question. There's a lot of things to comment on in the, in the question itself. And in my, work, in, my, in my work with therapy, there's no difference in how I would approach these questions with men or with women. So, but it's a very interesting point that they may hold themselves because the therapist isn't supplying the ideals or the values. And that's a, instead you have to, the, the, the person, re, the patient in this case, is then calling forth on their own store of values and ideals. The, but the first question we always ask is, uh, in, the, in this one model, if you th could think of your spouse or significant other praising you to someone who doesn't know you and how well you treat them. 
what would it make you happiest to hear them say? And then you get to the core things that motivate the person in their primary relationship in life. And then think, well, that I'm generous, that I'm loving, that I'm supportive, that I'm wise. So those are gonna be the ideals that help the person continually to, 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 to practice whenever challenges come. So they're gonna learn a kind of direction of, lean, when you lean into the challenge, it means being loving or generous or kind, no matter how you feel. You might feel hurt, you might feel angry, you might feel, but you still try to then reframe that as an opportunity to practice this ideal. And that's the nice thing, is it gives you then a freedom from your, how you feel so that you can guide your behaviors by your actions. That's just one element, but let that out. I, uh, a couple of comments. <clears throat> one about the issue of female values, and a lot of the studies were done looking at gender differences. I think we really need to remove gender from that discussion. Wherever they came from, we, if we really want these values to be preeminent, then we have to talk about them as preeminent values for all people. Um, the other is how to integrate into the curriculum is a much more difficult question. Um, and it's, it's one that it doesn't happen overnight. Again, that's, if you want to take that battle on, it's going to go on for a long time. And it's having conversations with the dean, with the chair of departments, with the individual teachers, maybe beginning and getting a cadre of people that are like-minded to begin the conversation of what does it look like for us to teach this in different parts of the curriculum and to slowly infiltrate it, even if it has to be snuck in. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be simple for some, you know, if you're outside the philosophy department, it may be the simple question during a marketing class of what does it look like to market with dignity? In an HR class, okay, what does it look like to uh, have a uh, cut in, in uh, employees with dignity? How do you, how do you uh, separate employees with dignity? Um, and having that conversation about what it looks like, but also a number of things are happening. One is the question came up in HR class, like, whoa, where'd that come from? Or marketing class or sales? I think I... I don't know if I said it here, I said it to someone outside. I work for a software company. And for me, one of the questions is, how do you sell with integrity when half your product is vaporware? What do you tell your clients? How do you promise? Um, so I think that it, that's a long process, but it's one that has to begin. And it has to begin by finding allies, like any great change. Find your champions, find your allies. Find somebody senior who's championing it. Because if the dean is against it, it's going to be a long time. This is why I say leadership has to be on board Absolutely, on the top of the line. Right. I, I, let me just take a <clears throat> biological um, perspective on your question of gender. So one of the um, really um, eye-opening literatures that I've read in preparation for writing this book is evolutionary biology. And they talk about, E.O. E. Wilson is my hero, uh, and in, in his book, Social Conquest of the Earth, he describes how we have inherited both self-interested, self-preservation instincts to protect our individual self, but he said, and which is not the more commonly understood aspects of our inherited, um, our evolutionary legacy, is the fact that we are, we are also wired for connection with other people. And so you see what you talk about as the feminine and the masculine dominant narratives, they're really biological imperatives that are at war with one another within us. And E.O. Wilson says that we are, we're actually, he said, in, internal conflict is inherent to the human condition. So don't think if you're in conflict on the inside that there's anything wrong with you. That's just about being human. And he said, we're going to be plagued by ruthless ambivalence because of these two competing um, biological predispositions that we have. You know, on one hand, we want to protect ourselves and our own self-interest, but on the other, we need connection so desperately. They're both survival mechanisms. And we're, that's what we're at war. I mean, I, that's my take on it. We're at war internally with the need to self-protect and the need to be connected. And I think, and he says, you know what he says? The only way we're going to survive as a species is if we get better at connection. We need the empathy aspect of it. So... The, we all got to get a little bit better at loving and connecting and all of that. To, to follow up on that, I think that in business school or wherever, we don't give enough uh, 
we don't uh, admit enough to what human behavior is normally. Exactly. We don't admit our own failings, things that drive us, that make us see the world in one way, even though we're trying to tell people to see it otherwise. And until we understand those drives, admit that they're there, and figure out how to work with them, mm -hmm. how to use them as the force that moves things forward, I think we'll spin our wheels sometimes. Yeah, how do we leverage that? Yeah. There's also, I think it's in relationships with like, friends and spouses and mentors and therapists that people have a chance to practice sincerity. Mm -hmm. And it's so, it's, it, sincerity is a virtue that you only get by practicing. Mm -hmm. So you don't, just by wanting to be honest, you're not suddenly sincere. But when you have something that's hard to admit to yourself and then you find that you can admit it to someone else, then you actually are growing strong. Okay, we have uh, three front rowers next. Two ladies, then Manolo, and then we'll take it uh, back. Thank you. I'm Gail O'Brien, and I'm an executive coach and leadership columnist, and I've been connected to Bentley Center for Business Ethics for several years. My question is really building off, and I love the question about relevance and how the abstract concepts get brought to us. So as I think we all struggle with that. Everyone thinks they're ethical, but then we watch behavior. We think we're ethical, and we watch behavior. When you talk about high ideals in particular, I think what's wonderful about that is that it forces us to think about what we stand for. Mm -hmm. And in the absence of it being brought to the place of what we stand for, it's all very potential that isn't mm -hmm. real. What I think needs to happen next, and what I've observed, and I'm curious about your, because it's a partly about vocabulary, but I think vocabulary matters. Mm. I think it's important for students, and I've noticed this on campuses, and I've noticed it working with executive um, C-suite people. We don't really think about what we stand for as leading to something specific. They're just there. And so to me, and I'd like to know what the panel thinks, Defining one's sense of purpose as early as freshman in college, knowing it can evolve, mm -hmm. is incredibly empowering because it pulls together what you've all talked about in terms of, of the kinds of things that help keep someone moving forward. I think it also addresses resilience in a really mm -hmm. powerful way. We can get through really difficult times if we know that our higher purpose is that we're a teacher and we are committed to students actually getting the information that will help them lead mm -hmm. more productive lives. Or we're a consultant and we're committed to leaders succeeding. Without that piece of it, I'm thinking that it stays more internal and doesn't get externalized. And I'm wondering what you all mm -hmm. think. Or it stays more abstract. Yeah. Or something. I think that one of the things that they need most in beginning college is uh, having a role model or role models, and the more a person has thought about their own ideals or values that they're going to be committed to, the more then they're going to be on the lookout for people who are exemplify this. But in the face of an actual challenge, a role model is a much more rich uh, reframe than a simple concept or word. So I think that's the importance of mentoring, actually, too, is that the mentor is a role model and is constantly helping them to reframe. Uh, should I introduce myself again? Sure, why not? Okay. Uh, Paula Gutlove, I teach negotiation and leadership at Simmons College uh, School of Management. So thank you very much again. Um, I just wanted to mention, uh, I, you probably know this, uh, Leon mentioned the Hippocratic Oath that we all take in medicine and in uh, business school there's a principal leaders oath, the MBA oath, that students take and sign when they graduate, uh, which is similar to the Hippocratic Oath. And uh, so business schools are beginning to recognize the need to have a purpose and meaning and uh, principles. And uh, there's an organization called Net Impact, which is for MBAs to have a positive social and environmental impact. And uh, this is a, and I'm a Net Impact advisor, and I've spoken at Net Impact conferences. So these, these are all wonderful things. But then my students tell me, but what about the real world? 
And the real world is one in which they graduate from business school or from college with huge student debt. The real world is one in which the cost of housing in most of the cities that our students want, that millennials want to live in, is way beyond anything they could even dream of unless they go into high tech or something that is not a net, not net positive social or environmental impact. So we have this question, how do you balance caring and dignity and ethical behavior when you want to have your basic needs met and you have to pay back your huge student debt. The other piece, so that's part one, and part two is how do we connect and form caring relationships when more and more of our relationships, especially for millennials, are happening <coughs> online, through phones, through virtual media. So. <coughs> That's the real world that my students say, well, what am I going to do? So. I, I, I want to sort of yeah. jump in because you framed it as either or. And so I would offer you the paradoxical and. Why is it impossible to enter the business world and be caring and have a value-based world, whether you're in high tech? Yes, if you choose and caring to you means I'm going to work for an NGO in Southeast Asia, that's good. And if I'm going to go work for IBM, that's good too, because you can still fulfill these. I mean, it's a matter of framing it as I mean, the challenge we always face is it's either or. You can either be ethical or be in business. Really? Um, so I think that it's partly, at least for that piece, it's a matter of helping them understand you can do both. And yes, there are realities. There are always realities. One of the challenges, you know, as a compliance officer trying to teach people to stay within certain bounds is yeah, there are realities. There are laws. There are real challenges. There are debts, and they have to be paid. Um, but that doesn't mean you have to stop everything else. I, I just, you always use the word compliance officer, and I'm sorry, this is totally off the point, but. I, I'm, I don't like that word, compliance. I hate it too. But oh, that, you do? Okay. That's, that's a term of art. It's what exists. It's the way the government well, uses it. Well, you've got to change it. You've got the power. And, um, yeah. 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 anyway, but, I, well. but you're right. No, it's a terrible word. Yeah. Because it's mm -hmm. external, not something yes. you want to do for yourself. Yes. Yeah. My are you, are you going to say more than that? No. My short answer is uh, think about a career in medicine, <laughs> at least psychiatry. So, because we need people with good ideals going to psychiatry. So, the, uh, but is that the, the response to my MBA student? Yeah. <laughs> uh. So, but I would say that when you're, when you're thinking about, um, so there are, there are different stages in, in peak performance psychology that they talk about unitasking. Okay, and there's a kind of uh, occasional unitasking is when you connect to the task at hand. That's a content dependent unitasking. Mm -hmm. And that's the last mention that gets made of content when it comes to work. Then you have, the, above that, you have more sequential unitasking, where the person is learning how to be continually challenging themselves to give their best in each activity. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what keeps them in flow. So because it's not just occasional flow, but it's actually you know, now that they're consistent in it. But that is no longer task dependent or content dependent. Now it's actually your way of working that's doing it. But above that, you have what you could call simple unitasking, which is that your whole day is essentially now one thing. And every, no matter what the career is, you're able to see the whole day as an act of service, as an act of love that's merely instantiated in the various tasks of the day. But the intention is one and the same the whole day long. And that is what produces what they call vital engagement. When your ultimate reasons for your life of wanting to be loving, wanting to be of service, wanting to do what's the highest meaning, uh, is now being lived throughout the course of the day. So I think that it can be done within any kind of job and any kind of setting, provided that you yourself are challenging yourself in that to be the most ethical you can be, to do the best that you can do in it. I want to go back to your comment about when your students ask you either or, and I said maybe it's and. The other thing I would point out is you should look from your students back to the curriculum in the school. If their view of the world, it's either or, probably that's the that's education great. they got 
even if it wasn't overtly stated. It's what they saw in their different classes and how they were structured. And part of the answer back to your students is actually to go back and think about, are there ways we can change the curriculum? Mm -hmm. So when they leave here, they don't even ask either or because for them it's and. Mm -hmm. Manolo. And I wanted to take advantage of my question to <clears throat> give thanks to everyone for being here. So I'm Manuel Aguilla, I teach, I, I work at the University of Valencia, I don't have a teaching answer. Uh, MBA student, half of the, the other half I'm spent here representing the university and organizing the stuff that's going on. And I want to say thank you to each one of you because this conversation is possible because of you, not just the panelists, all of you here. And then my question has a lot to do with each one of the person, of the, uh, Speakers talking about, you know, ideals and then and fear and living with that and virtues and then dignity and a punitive life and then role models and I say okay, but I'm a, I was a millennial even though you are not trying to believe that I was <laughs> no, I was a young man <laughs> and I had a lot of fears I had a lot of fears and I think this is common in every young people they are they all have fears so if we present in front of themselves as people that we had and we still have fears, and we present vulnerable in front of them, they probably would say, okay, I can't keep the conversation with you guys. You know what it is. So I can tell you, I was really scared to organize this colloquium five years ago. <laughs> and it was Michael Hoffman, and then him, and then a lot of people here, not on his, of course. <coughs> Thanks to all of them, I decided, okay, let's do it. Someone has to do it, let's do it. So, but you had a lot of fears, and we still keep having fears. So I want to ask them, each one of them, because we are in a prestigious university here, and with these four people here that they're supposed to be prestigious, they're in the table. Um, <laughs> <laughs> successful, successful, <laughs> successful and happy. And so I want to hear from you, do you really have experiences of fear before? <laughs> Are those ideals helping you to solve the problem of fear that you had? What kind of fears you had? I want really to hear from professionals that know, talk about that. <laughs> do you really have that feeling? Do you still have that feeling? Uh, that could that be helping young people to say, okay, we're in the same you know, classroom? How about Rita goes first? Rita <laughs> <go> first. <laughs> I really fear today yeah. <laughs> because it's the first time that I'm speaking in English in a pa as a panelist. So for me, it was a, a real challenge to stay here today. And I think I'm able to, st to stay here because someone uh, trusts me, and this person is uh, Manuel. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I know you, you don't like it, but I mean, I think it's very important to, to trust uh, our students mm -hmm. because we we mm, taking care of them and we trust them. I think they, they and we give them uh, our best. They, at the same time, uh, will uh, are able to give their best to, to other people. And of course, uh, their self-esteem uh, grows, yep. and I think it's important. Yeah, but still, I have a lot of fears. <laughs> um, I wouldn't say I have fear as much as I have terror. <laughs> um, I mean, as Manuel knows, I was you know, very fearful of being on this panel, because for me, it's like, who am I? I'm not an academic. I'm my career has gone in all kinds of ways, and you know who wants to listen to me? Um, and the earlier part of my career, I mean, if you're a surgeon and you're not afraid, you have a problem. Yeah. Uh, that's right. <laughs> a really big problem. And so admitting that fear both to myself and to um, students and residents was an important part of helping them as well as myself, since we all understand we're human, we're not perfect. Um, and we do our best and that's part of growth and that's how you get there is how you deal with your fear it's not having it it's how do you hold it how do you cope with it as spoke to what do you use it for and can you make it productive and sometimes you can and sometimes you can't and that's okay too so i think probably my my greatest fear is uh not being helpful so and the greatest suffering i've had in life have been uh dealing with people i can't help and that's caused the biggest growth times in my life mm -hmm. because trying to assess, you know, if there's a bad outcome, what went wrong, and how could I have done anything to help. And uh, that, that process has, 
continually led me to actually be growing and improving. Now when it comes to fear, it's, it, I feel like I experience only adrenaline that then I'm excited to have. <laughs> So uh, I, I, there's a, so I think that you can say that anxiety or fear is really mm -hmm. adrenaline plus unwillingness. Mm -hmm. So to the extent you're unwilling to have it, you call it anxiety. To the extent you're willing to have it, you call it excitement. And so as soon as I notice that's the good. adrenaline, then I, I think I automatically <coughs> reframe it. Uh, that's why I love horror movies and uh, amusement park rides and <laughs> horror movies. I love being scared <laughs> and looking forward to, to opportunities to be scared. But then you're always wondering, like, is what I have to say going to be actually useful to people? So that's the fear. OK, so I think um, just so you know, that it's not an accident that I have become um, interested in dignity. Because I felt my entire early life, I felt like I was unworthy, I wasn't smart enough, I wasn't deserving enough to be, like, coming to Harvard, are you kidding? I mean, I was a little, I grew up in the country of, in uh, upstate New York, and, you know, a little town of 2,500 people. And I think what I feared the most was my own ignorance at that time, being exposed, being exposed, my ignorance exposed. But so there's no, again, there's no accident. Um, this, this concept has been following me around my whole life, and it wasn't until maybe 10 years ago that I decided to study it that I realized, okay, this, this is what you have to fight, is this feeling of unworthiness. And so now that I understand my worth, I mean, there's nobody in this room could talk me out of believing that I'm unworthy, that I'm worthy. Nobody <laughs> said it wrong. You get the point. You will, you will lose that fight with me. You will lose that fight because nothing can, will challenge my worth anymore. And my biggest fear is not fear of looking stupid. My biggest fear are external fears. I fear ISIS. I fear... The, 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 our political system is going to break mm -hmm. down. I fear um, that we are not going to live up to our f biggest challenge right now, which is our challenge to get better at loving, because I think it's the only antidote. I think it's the only antidote. And showing people how to love through treating each other with dignity, if we could start with that, you know, if we could get to that point, I think we would see um, a lot less fear in the world. If I may, as a political scientist, on, on the question of, of fear and, and, and um, institutions, again, to return to that, Alexis de Tocqueville, one of my favorite um, you know, writers and thinkers, a French um, uh, political thinker, you know, one of the things that he warned uh, us about, especially in the United States, in democratic United States, is the creation of a new uh, industrial fearless aristocracy. In other words, something um, of the sort that we may have seen the last 30 or 40 years. In other words, I, I'm afraid a lot of our ruling classes do not have fear about uh, certain standards, certain ways of behavior, the people. So there's all of these tens of millions, <coughs> hundreds of billions of dollars, in fact, in offshore accounts, for example, that we've learned. And people Panama. just don't, don't fear that the laws will be enforced or maybe ethics will be force, they have no shame, they have no fear. It seems like a lot of our, again, um, elites, if I can use that political science technical term, are just um, free to do as they, as they will. And um, again, so like Donna, I, I have that fear, but I wonder if uh, uh, our elites have not exempted themselves from the rest of the society and if there's not th th all that much that we can do. I don't know, compliance officer? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if there are things we can do other than to get them to read history maybe and understand that uh, mm -hmm. in the course of 100 to 200 years is a short time, but a lot of uh, empires and uh, autocracies and, and tyrannies disappear over time because the nature and tendency of the world in general is to make them go away. Mm. Uh, but sadly, <laughs> we may not be here when it happens and we'll have to live through them. But you know, nature doesn't work on hours and weeks. Yeah, huge social costs that can be paid in the, in the process. <laughs> yes, uh, the lady in the second row, yes. Hello, I'm Mary Jo White and I am an educational administrator from Chicago actually. And as I'm listening to what you're saying, presenting this mission and presenting these ideals, 
I'm thinking very practically, how do I help educators? How do we map this? How do we concretize it? And so I'd like to ask a very specific question about preconditions to achieving this, and then open it up broader. So first, my specific question would be more directly to Dr. Majors, seeing in students technology addiction, feeding anxiety, it's the elephant in the room, but when we mention it to someone who has it, it's you don't want me to have friends or there's a part of my identity you don't want. So what are the institutional structures that we can be building so we're not targeting people's beloved needs but rather are helping them build freedom? And then from you to the other panelists, what are the other preconditions? You know, the technology addiction I see, what are the other things institutions need to be aware of to be pre creating positive conditions so that we can be fostering this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, when it comes to technology, I think one thing is the use of technology. Primarily, I see this more in adults, actually, just, just as a pure distraction. But, uh, but in, in, in kids, you can see it with video games as well. And so uh, the people, when they're under stress, they try to cope by distracting themselves from the stress. And there, the technology is like an anesthetic in the same way that drugs can be and alcohol, you know, that there are people use things to dull the sense of being stressed out. Uh, it's different in a way when it's about you, the use of technology to actually stay connected to friends. And, and, and so in a way, you do want actually the, them to have friends and to be connecting that there have to be some kind of clear policies, that their friends don't feel left out if they don't reply quickly. And the clearer policy the school has, the more it lets them off the hook, so that they're able to then not get back to people. Because it's an insult if you don't r respond within a minute. So, and yeah. the, so, so, but the clearer policies that are there for schools, I can't imagine really why th they need to have digital devices with them during school. So I, uh, I, would, I would love to see it where they, where they didn't. I know of schools where they don't. You're talking about college or high school? No, no, high school and, and below, mm -hmm. yeah. For college, they have to have the self-mastery. Uh, but even there, they need periods of the day where they're not communicating. Mm -hmm. And they have to train their friends uh, to not expect an immediate response if it's before 5 p.m. So that there's some sense where, okay, during this time from 9 until 5, this is my work time. And I don't respond quickly during that. But then they learn. The more also they get their work done quickly by working at their best and are able to actually have evenings free, the more time they have for forging better relationships. So I think, you know, I think the problem with technology right now is that it <coughs> has overtaken our, the time and space that we need to de learn how to be good in relationships, to learn how to be good human beings, to learn how to um, yeah, just to relate to one another in a way that is, you know, is helpful to each other and to build relationships. And I think, you know, one of the things that I do when I go into schools or any organization, I use um, some neuroscience, uh, some research in neuroscience to convince people that this issue of relationship building and learning how to honor dignity with each other is so crucial. And the, the neuroscience is that, um, that when, um, people experience a physical wound, it actually uh, affects the part of the brain, which is the most ancient, the amygdala, Kevin knows this so well, in the limbic system. It's a part of the, it's the pain center. It's where deep emotions are felt. It's where fear lives. It's, uh, and that, those are very primitive, if not primal, um, response mechanisms when, our, when those things happen. So you break an arm, let's say, and of course the pain is going to be excruciating, right? It's, and it, your amygdala lights up in a, in a brain scan like you wouldn't believe when you experience physical pain. But the interesting part of this research is that they have found that when people's dignity is being violated, their sense of value and the sense of worth is being violated, it shows up in the same part of the brain as if you experienced a physical wound. <coughs> so that amygdala goes crazy when somebody humiliates you, um, you know, discriminates against you, treats you unfairly, all of these 10 elements that I was telling Desmond about. Um, they all can trigger this deep emotional reaction. And so I say to people, I say, look, this isn't just touchy-feely work, this dignity work. This is fundamental to our humanity. 
this is deep, we need this understanding of how to treat each other because otherwise we're gonna be all of us walking around like the walking wounded. And there isn't any human being that I've met yet who hasn't experienced profound dignity violations. And so here we are, we've got this, I think we have this epidemic of indignity that's, that we're facing and, um, and know where to go for it. You know, when you have a physical injury, the first thing you do, you go to the doctor, you get the nice cast, put it on your arm. But when you have a wound to your dignity, you go inside. It's so shameful. It feels so uncomfortable to even admit you've, had, you've been treated so badly. So I think alerting educators, um, alerting business leaders, my next book is called Leading with Dignity. So what does it look like? And leaders have to have this dignity consciousness of the importance of it. They have to know about these research studies that are proving that treating each other in a way that honors one another matters probably the most. So that's the bottom line and that's, um, that's what I think. Because you know, John Nesbitt, I love this quote, he said, um, the breakthroughs that happen in the 21st century aren't going to come because of technology, but because of a, an ever-expanded understanding of what it means to be human. And this is what we're getting. You know, neuroscience is helping us with this, among many other mm -hmm. disciplines. So, Just on a practical level, uh, you can't introduce it to the whole school at once. You need to find champions. You need to find people who have power. You need to find not only people who have authority, but others who actually have power. Um, and you begin to convince them, and then you maybe do it as a trial in one class or something. But there's no reason that in a class there can't be a set of rules that basically says, okay, you've walked through the door, turn off your, I mean, we all did it. These are just the rules. This is the way it is. It's not, you know, it's only an hour, an hour and a half or two or whatever. The world does not end. Earth is still spinning on its axis. The sun is still out there. Uh, and the messages will still be there. Uh, and then it just expanded. If that goes well, other faculty hear about it and say, I like that idea. But it's a journey. If you decide today that you want to change everything, it'll be 10 years from now before it's done. If that. Professor Torres. Thank you. I'm Max Torres from the Bush School of Business and Economics at the Catholic University of America. And I'd like to thank you all for your comments. And I wanted to shift gears a little bit. You know, the topic was millennials and education. And maybe to step back from some of the very personal things we're talking about right now, and just ask your opinion from, the, from, the, from your various disciplines about some events that have occurred with our millennial students and universities in the last few months, uh, particularly at my alma mater, which is UC Berkeley, where there was some torching of, of cars and buildings because of the speaker who was invited. And there was another incident at Middlebury College where a, a professor who actually invited somebody to speak got her neck twisted and you know, got it wrenched. And I, I'm just wondering, from maybe a further back perspective, of, or maybe, maybe a closer perspective, of how much of this is the product of their education and what they're getting in education? And I'm wondering, what should be education's response to this? Is this, where do we go from here? What happens? If this keeps happening, it's somewhat reminiscent on the obverse side of what happened in the 60s and what I grew up with in the 70s. And it almost seemed like the whole world was turned on its head from there. So anyways, if I could just have your comments, I appreciate your, your learned responses. I guess if I, I'd go back to Aristotle's rhetoric where he talks about anger in public and says it's, that it's always a response to an attack on dignity. Actually, oh, is that right? He does, yeah, <laughs> contempt. So being <laughs> that one of the things that people do in response to a deep emotional pain you know, is they, have an, they, they fight back against it. It's called the fight or flight response. Sure. That's what comes from your amygdala, the sympathetic nervous system. So this is dealing with the fight component of it. And so there's a, there's a, when people have anger problems, they are quickly triggered and then they quickly strike. If they could slow down time, and feel what was going through my heart right before I got angry, they would feel profound pain. So, and, and that would be the, 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 the real trigger. So the purpose of anger, Aquinas says, is that sadness not exceed its limits. 
with these examples you're giving though in, in Berkeley and Middlebury, I'm not exactly sure what is causing them the pain. You know, I haven't gotten to treat any of them as patients. So I, I don't know what's motivating it. Is the kind of togetherness of a group striking against a common enemy, you know, which is more, that's a, that's a different kind of political issue where it's purely at that point political. You know, or is it that these are people who in some way are finding um, old wounds being touched and that's what's drawing them together and they're striking out? So I don't know. See, um, I, I have no answers, but part of it is the loss on campuses, it seems, around the country of the defense of free speech and, and what campuses are for the exchange of ideas that you may not be comfortable with and potentially the need for the university to help students hold their anger and fear while they hear things they don't like, knowing that there is a response and sometimes the best response is to let the person talk and notice that the audience thinks that the person's an idiot um, and that everybody agrees with them. Uh, it is very difficult to hear hateful speech, to hear terrible things said, um, but at the same time, the universities you know, and, and the faculty have to defend the fact that we have free speech. And that means you will hear things you hate. And that's the right of the person to say them. And there's no obligation on your part to agree with them or to even think that they're okay. But they do have the opportunity. And I, I don't know the answer, but you know, there's an explanation of why they lash out. Mm -hmm. But it, I don't, personally don't think it's an acceptable response. Well, I think we have to look at this in the broader political context. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I mean, I can empathize, actually, with why somebody would want to um, stand up and be vociferous. I mean, I don't know if I can empathize with wanting to bash somebody in the head, but, <laughs> but we're, in a, we're in a very difficult political environment now where all the things that many of us value, I mean, dignity, are you kidding me? Th this guy is a master of indignity. And, and so for me, I, I'm torn about how I should react. I'm totally torn. Do I go on my blog and do I just, you know, call him out? I don't know. Or what do I do? And I can imagine if I were a young college student now that, I mean, I know the, the kind of outrage that I experienced when I grew up about the, when political things were happening that I didn't like. I was very vocal, but, but the thing is, it really creates a tremendous dilemma for us, whether you're young or whether you're old or no matter what. <coughs> what do we do to stand up and say what is happening now is not acceptable? How do we do, we do that? And you, know, you get someone like Charles Murray who, um, who has not espoused some of the most dignified um, ideas in this world or the alt-right guy, what's his name? Um, I mean, these are extreme people that we're talking about. And so I don't know, I'm just, I'm just talking about the, the E.O. Wilson's living with ruthless ambivalence, you know? <laughs> this is an example of living with ruthless ambivalence. But, but there are ways sometimes to channel that anger. I mean, I know one of the things is my wife is not a very political person, and this last year she is off the wall. And her solution was to join Indivisible a group of people that were doing something so she could feel she was doing something. Yeah. And she's involved with the movement and she's channeled her anger into an activity that she feels makes a difference in the world. Um, yeah. And maybe it's a matter of universities trying to find a way to help channel <coughs> into positive <coughs> actions that are nonviolent and make people feel that they have power over what's happening. I want to get to at least two more uh, folks. So yes, please, right in the middle, and then we'll go up to the front row. Uh, thank you all for um, uh, being here today. And this is my second time at the colloquium. I came three years ago, so it's great to be back. Um, Kevin uh, Majors, I have pain and anger when I drive in Boston. So perhaps we can <laughs> get together afterwards. And, um, can you introduce yourself as well? So, right, my name is Chris Kelly. Uh, I do marketing and communication specifically in uh, the larger nonprofit uh, sector. Um, I also consult with some uh, educu educational institutions as well as uh, some religious organizations. Um, my question and kind of reflection is um, I'm wondering how much uh, of a role, so we're seeing this growth in anxiety across all demographics, um, but with millennials especially what role that higher education in general has to play in that rise of anxiety 
And where I'm coming from with this is specifically with the idea of identity and the formation and unity of person, the formation of the whole human person, which is something we used to see in, a, in classical understanding of education, that we're yes. forming the whole yes. person. Mm -hmm. As Leon was saying, that we're in this reality now where everything is compartmentalized. Ethics is here and business is here. Whereas education is meant to play this role in, in the formation of persons. But then also, Rick um, kind of uh, illuminated something here when he was speaking specifically about, for me, the, um, we have all these great universities who had a, a foundation at one point, oftentimes in a religious um, uh, foundation, be it Methodist, Lutheran, Catholic, whatever the case may be, where there was kind of in that formation um, a sense of morality, a sense of ethics that was instilled uh, as part of that education. And as universities have stepped away from that religious reality, and again, I'm, this isn't a, a religious uh, argument per se, and we focus more on the age of specialization, hyper-specialization, um, when we focus on diversity, what are we offering our students in terms of identity, in terms of morality? Where do we have to draw from from that? Um, especially in the, in the age of hyper-specialization. You know, it's uh, th there's a couple different ways to go with that, but thank you all. Donnie, you're my dignity champion. I, I quote you all the time. It's, it's great. <laughs> You know, all I can say is yes. <clears throat> um, I think universities have to look at, um, you know, for me, I see it in people going into medical school and in medical school, and suddenly they're only what they are. You know, as the old saying goes, if all you have is a hammer, then the whole world is a nail. Um, and you see even in uh, undergraduate schools where people are concentrating into one field or another, the whole concept of the liberal arts that you would, uh, I did the six year program at BU when it first started and they, interestingly, what was very important to them is in the first uh, two years in every summer is you had nothing to do with science or medicine basically, mm -hmm. that you were taking advanced courses in philosophy or English or something as well as the required biology. Um, I don't know what the answer is, but I think part of it is the world gets more specialized and demands more specialization, and there's less time to get ready to do it. And that's a challenge, I think, for the universities. Maybe it's a colloquium, maybe it's a discussion about how to move from this world of ultra-specialization and compartmentalization. How do we break, even now, I remember in, in the hospital when I was working, there was all this discussion about breaking down the silos. They all these consultants, which ended up in creating large binders and more silos. Um, it's a real challenge. How do you break? How do you have the conversations? This center is one of the places where people have conversations across education, business, healthcare, and other places, and and bring the fertility of all those ideas together. It used to drive me up the wall uh, in healthcare when I was doing the compliance and privacy role that I couldn't get the members of the hospital to come and have conversations with businesses outside of healthcare. It's like they felt like they had nothing to learn from it. And it's like, why well, are you crazy? Um, so it's, but again, the universities have to start modeling that behavior, have to start having teaching across the boundaries mm -hmm. um, and have people, it used to, one of the questions that I never got answered in my life was, and there is no answer even today. <laughs> so you have nursing school, social work school, respiratory therapy school, medical school, everybody learns, they all take anatomy, and to my knowledge, the human anatomy is the same regardless of which school you're in at that time. And then they'd put you in the hospital after you graduated and said, work together and collaborate. Okay, your entire world was spent not socializing with the other specialty, <laughs> and now you're magically supposed to work together? Why not teach them all together? Mm -hmm. Why not put them and have them socialize from the very beginning? If the anatomy didn't change, then let the nursing students, the medical students, physical therapy students, everybody take anatomy together, talk to each other. Um, and I think that it really is in part, again, structure. If you structure your educational system as silos, are you surprised when the world is functioning in silos? Mm -hmm. Not really. Yeah. Uh, so, and that's a real challenge. How do you structure it across a university? So people from different schools, um, 
you know, I'm sure there are law classes that other people in marketing and other places in business need to take about certain things in law. Why don't the law school and everybody sit down together and create a course where they all, granted the lawyers need to know maybe more detail, but they could sit together. Mm -hmm. They could exchange ideas. And I think that that's the challenge. I would say that I think that one of the main tasks of college, or you could say it's threefold task, uh, the first is the psychological task of learning how to work at your very best. The second is more social connected, and it's how do you put the needs of others first and see that what you're doing is for the sake of service. <coughs> and the, the third is when you're looking to really combine excellence and work with this spirit of service, then you're looking to be at the forefront of innovation in your field both technically and ethically. So for that, you could call it a psychological level and a social level and a spiritual intellectual level. That, that last level really does require philosophy and literature and history and knowledge of the liberal arts to be fully formed. We get ideals, we get our values from studying the great things in the tradition and in thought and to see what have been the best exemplars. You know, so which is what literature and art shows us. So all of that does come together, but that has to do with the final step in a way of college, which is the impact you can make in your profession in the world. We're gonna go a little bit into overtime and take one more question. Yeah. Uh, my name is Lauren Stiller at Clean. Uh, I spent uh, many years as a uh, an attorney in the environmental law remediation field, and then six years ago left to do speaking and training and consulting on generational issues, gender issues, Conscious bias, and um, my book, like I guess, is my, my generational issues book as you raised us now. Work with us trying to look at um, a more nuanced perspective on millennials and just trying to tie together some of the themes here. And starting with John's question about the Trump part of it and um, bringing this all together because I, I'm obsessed always with merging the practical and the theoretical, and I think we can't have the conversation we had today outside the context of what's happening mm -hmm. in the world. And your point, Donna, about the students' reaction, um, you know, I, I think we have to be more emboldened about how we speak out as the grown-ups in the room, in theory, around, yes, free speech is really critical, but does it really make sense for our universities today to bring in people who, who are whose speech is hate speech, mm -hmm. as opposed to fostering different ideas across different disciplines on, on opposite sides of the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. And we, we, we have to, I think, as, uh, as businesses or business leaders, be very vocal about you can, you can stand against everything Trump stands for without being political. Mm -hmm. without making it about politics. And I think point. that's what we have yeah. to start doing yeah. as part of the conversations. Mm -hmm. I don't care what someone's politics are. I do care about standing up against the inability to believe your government, the appointment of people who will tear down institutions that protect our air and water. I mean, these are conversations we need to have much more directly and not be fearful that we are looking political because it's not about our under underpinning underlying politics. It's about really how we are treating each other mm -hmm. and the behaviors that are being modeled at the highest levels of yeah, the world. Absolutely. Yeah. So I after the election I gave a lot of talks on um, you know, people were just in this in this community people were in agony. And so and still, um, and, and so I gave a talk about dignity and, and how can we disagree with dignity? How can we look at the people with whom we feel so um, alienated from and still look at them and say, you know what, you deserve to be treated with dignity no matter what. And just because we have a difference in beliefs, it doesn't mean that it's okay for us, that we can violate their dignity. So I think that would be the bottom line, and I consider myself an advocate of dignity, not of the liberal point of view or the conservative point of view. Uh, my eye is always looking for ways in which we can not only uh, not violate dignity, but promote dignity even in the worst of circumstances, and I think that's where we are right now. How, and that's challenging us in the biggest way. 
Thank you. That's that's mm -hmm. very nice. Before I make some uh, logistical concluding remarks, let me take this opportunity to thank our panelists uh, for a wonderful morning and early afternoon um, here. And thank you, RCC, and thank you, Yeko, for organizing this uh, wonderful uh, fifth colloquium, uh, uh, I believe. Uh, one of the, uh, in our informal discussions as well as a little bit of today, one of the themes that emerged or um, one of the areas to explore, perhaps at a future colloquium, uh, it, you know, was the perspectives of senior leadership on these questions. I think this is, we were, uh, uh, Professor Guillen and I were talking about, or thinking about, getting some business executives here to share their perspective on this. Perhaps that will be featured in one of the forthcoming uh, uh, colloquiums. They will be featured. And we could have a mix maybe of academics and, and practitioner business leaders. So that is to be uh, determined. But OK, let me also say that you are invited again to speak to the camera and uh, share your thoughts and, uh, uh, before, you, before you leave. But also, please join us for uh, lunch and some drinks, I believe, uh, next door. Thank you again for coming. Wonderful to meet everyone.